Okay. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the November 6th Lake Washington School Board meeting. I'll entertain a motion to approve the November 6th agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Director of Liberty, seconded by Director Bliesner. Um, all those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion carries. Uh, Dr. Pierce, will you please introduce our host school? Yeah, we are so pleased tonight to have Explorer Community School here. Uh, who happens to have a beautiful new facility. And uh, the wonderful uh, Karen Barker, who's the principal, is here. So welcome, Karen. And she's got a team of folks here with her. And so I will just turn it right over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having us. Mic on. Uh, thank you for so much for having us. We are really excited to have this opportunity to tell all of you about our amazing Explorer Community School, as well as the results of our first bond project that was completed over the summer for our students to start the school year with. I'm Karen Barker, and I've been the principal at Explorer Community School for seven years. Also here with me is Melissa Doring. She's the associate principal. And we have our teachers here as well. All three teachers are here present tonight. Speaking will be David Levitin. He's a fourth and fifth grade teacher. With him also is Deborah Shaw. She teaches a two, three multi-age. And Miss Kelsey Mailer is a one, two multi-age teacher. And so first I want to tell you a little bit about our unique campus because Explorer is a part of a larger overall campus out at Dickinson Elementary. Uh, at Dickinson we have about 540 students and they're served by about 70 staff members. Also out at Dickinson, you're probably well aware, we do have the Dickinson Preschool. This year we're serving about 130 students, and then we have about 32 staff members that work with our preschool students as well. So the third component of our campus is Explore Community School. And Explore has 72 students and three classroom teachers. And they're also served by the staff members and specialists over at Dickinson as well. So the mission of Explorer is to create a learning partnership amongst children, teachers, and parents. And the school teachers and parents are really intentional about how we go about doing that. How do we meet our mission? And so I would like for David Levitin to tell you a little bit about the unique focus of our school at Explorer. Thank you, Karen. I love the word, uh, the term learning partnership. It represents our school so well. It is a little deceiving. You might not realize all that it entails because it says among children, teachers, and parents. So you might think of kind of a triangle, kind of a unidirectional learning going on between these groups, but it's bi-directional. It's within each node. I'm constantly learning from my co-teachers. I'm learning from the students. I'm learning from the parents and they're learning from me as well. We provide opportunities in a lot of different manners to emphasize this learning partnership. And here you see some of our uh, parent-led activities. The students absolutely love these. Uh, we have both a regular hour session on a weekly basis and Friday afternoons, as well as a multi-week um, learning opportunity that's more extensive later in the year that the parents lead directly with the students. Uh, I think we have an example here of a cooking class as well as a uh, ink and brush technique using Chinese calligraphy tools. Now, the learning partnership goes the other way as well, as I said. Here is one of my favorite projects we've done in the last few years up in the upper left. What you see is, uh, well, we do have a new school and we're very grateful for it. And the students had an opportunity to think about, well, what would their new school be like if they had a choice of how to design it? They uh, formed architecture teams, multi-age teams. We had students from each class. So uh, they were a trio, uh, a triad, I guess. And here, those students are actually teaching a parent about some of their design ideas. And in fact, um, some of the uh, school um, staff from the Resource Center here came out and uh, got to learn about some of the design ideas as well uh, during that session of sharing. You also can see on the uh, far right side 
uh, one of the students' favorite learning opportunities, uh, Marketplace. We have an academic focus that associates with that every year. The students create products, but they also learn about how to advertise, how to survey people that they might want to sell things to. And they integrate that work in with uh, teaching each other great techniques. Our school also brings our learning opportunities outside of the classroom. We do a lot of field trips, but this has got to be one of our favorites. This is family camp. This is the entire community. Not only the students and their parents, but even the siblings, younger and older. We have alumni. I can see one in the um, more close-up picture uh, singing along with some of the songs she enjoyed and knew. And we come together every year at camp. That is a picture I just love. This is our 20-year learning celebration, and we delayed it by a year technically, because we had it 2017, but the reason we did that is because we realized we're gonna have this new school, and it's gonna be so cool to share that with the whole community. And so we, just this past month, had a 20-year and new school celebration. Um, I was hoping we'd get about 100 people there, and the turnout was just amazing. We have uh, over, well over 200 families all the way back to, um, as we said, the OGs of uh, Explore. We had some parents and staff that were there the very first year that shared in that fantastic celebration. And it really just indicates the way Explore is not just a experience while you're there, it's something that stays with you. And the alumni that participated in putting that incredible event together, we still appreciate them. This is right down here, actually. If you get a chance, get a closer look at it. This was a community art project that we did during our 20-year celebration, and uh, it's just another indication of the way we love to work together as a community. In the picture, I actually see alumni students, current students, a younger sibling, current parents, and alumni parent, and even the sibling of a student, um, a, and that sibling didn't attend the school, and she was welcome to participate in the project as well. So high quality teaching and learning are supported with daily parent volunteers to provide opportunities for differentiation and intervention at all levels. As a result, Explorer has consistently ranked amongst the highest performing schools in Washington. Explorer has earned the Washington State Achievement Award for the past seven years and has received the School of Distinction Award in 2014. In addition to the fact that um, Nearly all students in all in grades three through five met grade level standard in reading, math, and science last year. 81% of students met level four in math. 84% of students met level four in, in English language arts. And 94% of students in fifth grade reached a level four in science. High academic achievement is not the sole focus of Explorer. The school can, can remains consistently focused on ensuring they remain focused on all aspects of educating the whole child. As a part of our continuous improvement process this year, teachers are collaborating with our new full-time counselor to deliver the new second step curriculum weekly as a tier one intervention in the general education classroom. And they are progress monitoring student growth in social emotional skills connected to our district student profile within a regular cycle of inquiry. Teachers at Explorer regularly also collaborate with grade level peers at Dickinson and participate in campus wide leadership initiatives to ensure that the small school of Explorer continues to feel connected to the work of our whole campus. The teachers at Explore have routinely sought opportunities to improve teaching and learning across schools through their leadership in professional learning activities and initiatives within the district. We really appreciate for the service of the Explorer teachers. I think that the work that they do really benefits us across our district and they're really committed to that investment. So as Karen and David mentioned, we got a new school this year. We spent some time over the weekend um, moving in. Parents helped them to set up classrooms so that we were ready for the first day of students. If you've ever wondered 
what it looks like to see a bathroom suspended over a parking lot during a solar eclipse. <laughs> now you know. Um, so we really wanted to just take another moment to thank the voters who approved the 2016 bond measure to make this possible for our students. And um, the four modular buildings have been built with green technology and are now an enclosed campus, which just makes it so much safer. Students don't have to walk up to the big building to use the restrooms, they have their own. And um, it's really a fantastic opportunity to create an outside learning space and to have um, an increased safety for our increased safety for our campus. So, I'd like to show you a video that Explorer parents have created to show you all of the things that make Explorer great. My favorite part of being an Explorer is every month we go on a very fun field trip. Red light. Green light. I really like my school, Explorer. sing songs around the campfire and do like lots of games. On the mountain was a treasure buried deep beneath a stone. Probably like family camp and really getting to like know people and like making really good friendships and stuff. Explorations and Friday Choice, those are all really fun. Come on, let's dance. My favorite part of being a student at Explorer was being involved in the community and having such close friends around me all the time. It was a really good experience and I loved the teaching methods that the teachers used. We didn't just read everything out of a textbook, we actually had hands-on experiences while we were learning. Explore prepared me for middle school by teaching me lots of different things in ways that I would remember. I think almost everything about Explore is unique. All the kids get to learn about what other people are passionate about and what's exciting to them and it totally broadens their horizons and I think that's really one of the unique things about Explore. We all came together as parents and families and kids and um, really it was a big family. And it's the people, the parents who devote their time, the teachers who devote their time and energy to all these students and all these families. It all just come together. It makes it a big deal for me. Explore OG an original gangsta, one of the first founding Explorer families. Please stay standing for us. Give these people a round of applause. Amazing families that work closely together with the teachers. They work together. nice validation for us and we are really grateful for it our facility that we have is incredible you guys I hope all had a chance to take a look at it and we are so grateful to the community for funding it and that we get to enjoy it we have bathrooms I mean what, what's the deal with that <laughs>
And so finally, sharing the wonderful things about Explore would not be complete without highlighting our amazing partnership with our community members. First and foremost, our three lead teachers of Explore do amazing work, and as their principal, I could not be more proud or grateful to the work of these three teachers. Also, the second part of that partnership in our mission is the Explorer parents. They're in classrooms every day. They're organizing all of these events. They're supporting the teachers. They are nose to nose with kids, providing that support that really shows what parent collaboration can achieve through that effective partnership. Because again, the success of students at Explorer is a result of all of this partnership together. I also want to thank the Dickinson and Explorer PTSA. They provide leadership, support, and, and uh, enrichment opportunities for all students, even the students at Explorer. And I, without that partnership, I think that the opportunities for Explorer students would be limited within such a small school setting. But with the inclusion of the Dickinson PTSA, it really does feel like they get that comprehensive neighborhood school experience as well. The Dickinson staff, specialists, therapists, the office staff, the recess teachers, they're all a part of supporting the success of Explore and I'm grateful to them. And then finally, the support of the district leadership. Uh, Sue Ann Sullivan, the director of su uh, school support, the superintendents and cabinet level people that support all of our work of our school, and you, the school board, providing the leadership and direction of our district. We are very grateful to you because it's really all of those pieces of the puzzle that put together the success of Explore. Thank you. Well, it's clear that you miss the old portables dreadfully. I do. All right. Well, uh, that was actually lovely. Um, let me, sorry, find my cheat sheet again. So, uh, next we have, oh, one of my favorites, um, the recognition of our National Merit Semifinalist and Commended Scholars. So, Dr. Pierce. Great. So, again, just thank you to uh, Karen and Melissa and Explorer staff and parents. Uh, can you raise your hand if you're here for ex from Explorer tonight? We have some parents in the house. That's awesome. Thank you so much. It was just uh, great fun to hear all the wonderful things about the school. And as uh, Chris mentioned, we now have uh, recognition of students tonight, our National Merit Analysts and Commended Scholars from International Community School, East Lake High School, and Lake Washington High School. So we're going to start this evening uh, with International Community School, and Principal Margaret, Margaret Kinney is here. So Margaret, you can come on up to the podium here, and uh, we look forward to meeting your ICS students. Good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, if I have any ICS students, should they come up now? That would be great. Okay. So typically what we'll have you do is, uh, and because Margaret, I'm welcome. First. This is Margaret's first year yes. as principal at ICS. So, and so, and, uh, yes, and we have you going first. Okay. So we didn't even give you the benefit of letting uh, Chris or Christina go first. You've done this before. That's okay. I, <laughs> I can do it. I can do it. So That's great. Um, so we'll, what we'll have you do is um, uh, introduce them individually. Okay. We'll have you have them line up here. And okay. then we typically give the microphone to the students, and uh, they get to share with us. Uh, what their potential future plans Great. are and uh, um, potentially Great. one of their you know best highlights of ICS. Well okay? I am new to ICS and so I've inherited these very talented young people and I'm not responsible for their success at all but um, I'm very very lucky um, everyone at ICS is very proud of these students. Um, at, Approximately 3.5 million students take the PSAT every year. Um, so um, for International Community School to have four National Merit semifinalists and 18 commended students is just outstanding. So I'm very proud. So if you're here from International Community School, why don't you come forward? Is there a handheld mic? <laughs> so, 
so for the kids, actually for you as well, basically, who are you? Where do you hope to go to college? What's your major? And one minute story about your favorite teacher. Yeah. It doesn't have to be at ICS, it can be all the way back to kindergarten. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Stephanie Fulton, and um, I, I'm applying to like 10 schools, but I think my top choices would either be like Claremont McKenna College or um, USC, and I hope to maybe major in international relations, um, possibly minor or double major with computer science, maybe linguistics. And um, my favorite teacher at, well, is actually from ICS, uh, Mr. Over. He had to retire last year. Um, so we were sad to see him go, but he was a very interesting character. Um, <laughs> he was a lawyer. Uh, he advised the mock trial team that I've been on for four years. And um, he would always just go off on these interesting tangents and um, had all these catchphrases and made learning very interesting and um, memorable. Great. Hi, guys. My name is Anton. Um, as far as future college plans, I would love to go to the University of Washington here, our local school, or the University of Denver all the way in Colorado. Um, possible majors. I'd like to major in business, maybe a minor or a double major in engineering with that. And my favorite teacher would also have to be an ICS teacher. Um, our art teacher in junior year in eighth grade, Mr. Rader. Um, he's just such a great guy, such a genuine human being, really just a pleasure to learn from him and stuff. And while the class, it's not common core, it's not one of those subjects you would typically think would come in handy in college or whatever, but the lessons that we really learn there, just making personal connections with people and how to really express emotion through art, I think, is something that's going to last with me for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can sit down. So, We usually will be recognizing parents, but I think that we've got a lot of parents, so we're going to save that for all three schools at the end. Um, but uh, so with that. Great. So our next school is Eastlake High School, and Chris Beatty is here, principal at Eastlake, to introduce the Eastlake High School students. So if you're here from East Lake High School, come on up, please. Just like Miss Kinney, I'm too I'm very proud of the uh, National Merit Semifinalists and Commended Scholars from East Lake High School, uh, but especially for the students who made the effort to come here tonight uh, to be recognized. Uh, your, your hard work, your efforts are very much appreciated, um, and we're very proud of you as a school and a school district. So I'm going to just pass the mic down, you can tell us your name, um, the colleges you'd like to go to, your possible major, and best educational experience or best teacher. Thanks. All right, I'm Andy. Um, I wanna go to Columbia in New York for computer science. And my, um, my favorite experience was building hot air balloons in calculus. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maggie. I would like to go to UChicago. Um, and I'd like to double major in music and computer engineering. And my favorite, my favorite educational experience would be, um, I went to a nanotech program at University of Pennsylvania this summer, and we essentially got to do undergrad and graduate level nanotechnology research and lab work. And it was just really cool to um, experience like a bit of college before, before actually going, and just to have like a really in-depth experience with science and engineering. Um, my name's Reagan, and I'm hoping to go to either UW or the University of Notre Dame um, to study biochemistry and possibly minor in Spanish. And my best educational experience to date was probably in my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Romano, who really like introduced, she helped me develop my love for math and science and helped me develop my leadership skills in the classroom and with my parents and stuff. 
Um, I'm Neha, and I'm hoping to go to UW and study computer science. Um, and my best educational experience was probably taking EP Calc because it was the first math class that actually challenged me, and I really liked my teacher. Uh, my name is Lucas. Uh, I'm considering going to University of Washington. Uh, I'll likely be a psychology major. And probably my most influential uh, educational experience has been Pull Out Quest in elementary school. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, you'd go to an uh, advanced program once a week, and uh, you'd learn about various interesting uh, topics. Uh, at a young age, we were introduced to things like architecture, like Newton's laws of physics, and all kinds of other cool stuff. It was a really great experience to uh, learn about all that advanced stuff as a young kid. Thank you very much. Okay, and last but certainly not least, we have Lake Washington High School here, and uh, Principal Christina Thomas is here this evening to introduce the Lake Washington High School students. Thank you. Um, again, just like the other high school principals, we're all very proud of our um, scholar athletes and really want to um, acknowledge their parents and all the hard work the kids have put in. I don't know how many of mine are here tonight, but I do have um, two National Merit semifinalists and seven commended scholars and one uh, National Hispanic Recognition Scholar. So Lake Washington High School, come on down. Okay, so um, you know the drill, right? Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Hi, my name is Sam Dorsey. I'm currently in the process of applying to the University of Washington, among a few other schools. And currently, I'm planning to major in either political science or chemical engineering, but it's still kind of up in the air. And you said only one minute for favorite teacher. Anyway, <laughs> for sophomore and junior year, I had the privilege of learning from Mr. Dave Hale. He was my chemistry teacher and then my AP chemistry teacher. And I was lucky enough to learn from a man who truly loves his subject and helped me foster love for it as well. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle and um, I'm hoping to go to the University of Washington to study civil engineering. And one of my best educational experiences was taking AP World History with Mr. Dawson. Um, I really enjoyed taking the mock trials because um, it really challenged me as a student. Hi, my name is Grace. Um, I'm currently in the process of applying to the University of Southern California, hopefully majoring in international relations or business. My favorite academic experience would have to be also um, AP World History with Mr. Dawson. He's just an all-around funny, great human being. Um, and I'm Helen Sayre. I'd like to go to the University of Michigan and study computer science and business. And I have to second what Sam said about starting my mornings with Dave Hale and AP Chemistry. Fantastic. So um, <laughs> now what I'd like to do, now what I'd like to do is bring all the kids back up here because you've got parents out there who are just dying to be proud of you. Um, get all the kids back up here. Everybody just spread out in front of us so that we aren't in any of the pictures. And your parents can come up and take pictures of our national merits, semifinals, et cetera. And to the extent that, uh, yes, so there are probably going to be some parents who would like to take such pictures. Let's get those pictures. Um, and also um, a round of applause from the kids or a support staff out there, whether it's teachers, parents, principals, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of people who got here, got you here. Um, let's give your parents particularly a round of applause. Okay, parents, if you, got, if you haven't got your pictures, you should have moved faster. All right, um, <laughs> they're teenagers. Um, all right. So um, find another parent and share. Uh, and kids, uh, make sure you do touch base with your principal. There is a pretty little document that goes along with this um, that you should probably take home with you. Is there anything else? Uh, yeah. So we're, the next on the agenda is our public comment. Uh, our public comment tonight, there is going to be some public comment, but we also have some. 
We also have some high school students, and uh, I, I, much as I love them learning civic engagement, if you're a high school student, it's a weeknight. Go home and do your homework. You're still juniors. You've still got to get into college. So we'll take a couple of minutes to, yeah, uh, teachers. Um, so exactly. Once once we've got them out, then we'll get rolling with the um, public comment. And towards that end, sorry, it, it's about about the right number. Anyway, um, so welcome to a business meeting of the Lake Washington School Board. Um, on a monthly basis, we do provide an opportunity for public comment. Um, this is a period of time that is reserved for us to hear from the public. It's not a time for com conversation. Conversation is something that takes place outside of our, uh, our working meetings. Um, there are multiple avenues for public comment. Uh, we've heard a number of emails. I, I suspect from the sign-in sheet that a number of the people we're going to be hearing some of the similar things that we've heard on email. I'm very thankful that we have heard from you by email. I hate hearing from you for the first time when you show up to talk to us. Um, the, uh, this evening, we won't respond directly. If you want to stick around until we take one of our breaks, then you, you're welcome to uh, touch base with us in the hall. Um, typically, we allow up to 30 minutes on the agenda for public comment. At present, there are uh, 11 people signed up, given that we allow three minutes per person. Uh, as long as we abide by the timeline, that's cool. Um, so that'll help. Uh, there are a number of you who've signed up to speak up on speak on similar issues. Um, I appreciate the value of multiple voices, but at the same time, saying the same thing to us three times for three minutes each doesn't help you make your point all that much. Um, it, so if someone said something that you've already if, that you were planning to say, go ahead and just say me too. If there's more that you have to bring to the to that topic then say more. But saying the same thing over and over really doesn't help you make your point. Um, because some of us have jobs to get to in the morning. Um, now, uh, the three minute time limit, uh, if you haven't been here before, there's this lovely stoplight over there. The stoplight will be green when you're starting. When you start, come up to the mic in the middle, which is not currently hot, so if someone could turn that on, I'd appreciate it. Um, but, uh, yeah, Matt, you got that, great. Um, and, uh, oh, did he turn it on? Okay, sorry, I don't see it from this angle. Um, when you come up to the mic, please just tell us your name, your attendance area, um, and then uh, you'll have three minutes to speak. After two minutes, the light's gonna go yellow. After three minutes, it's gonna go red. There'll be a beep. When you get to three minutes, it's time to roll it up. Um, I try to be as polite as I can, but eventually I will use the gavel. Um, uh, in order to ensure that we hear from a variety of people, you can't donate your time to another speaker. That is, you have your three minutes. You can't put someone up there and have them speak for nine minutes and say, oh, these are three people were represented by this person who was brave enough to face the microphone. Um, there is a certain amount of bravery in this. I, I acknowledge that. This is how I started my relationship with school board is by providing public comment. Um, so I, I have a great amount of respect for those of you who are coming here. Um, now, uh, when your name is called, please do come up, speak into the microphone. Um, now, keep in mind, uh, this is a, uh, it's not only a public meeting, it's a recorded meeting that's made available publicly. You are on TV, so to speak, with a very narrow but very interested audience, um, and you are on the internet for time immemorial. So um, there are a couple of, there are only a couple of things that we will not take public comment on. That is, we don't talk about HR. Um, that is, you don't talk about named staff individually unless you're telling us how, exactly how wonderful and awesome that particular staff member is. Um, other, otherwise, keep and try to keep above the fray. Um, and also, audience members are expected to treat all attendees with respect and civility. Not that that's ever a problem. Um, so the first person signed up to address the board this evening is Sabrina Miller. Um, if you'll please come on up. Thank you. Um, I'm Sabrina Miller, and I um, in the in the excuse me Juanita Learning Community. I'm a parent and PTSA co-president at John Muir Elementary in Kirkland. I'm here to talk about the overcrowding issues John Muir is experiencing. I am aware that overcrowding is an issue throughout the district, but Muir is unique in many ways, and we need more space now, not later. After recent emails with the district, we do understand that there are plans in place for a portable at Muir next year. 
However, the mirror community is just finding this unacceptable. The district needs to re-examine our school's multiple requests for classroom space now and not wait until next year. We're now in the second year of using what was supposed to be a temporary floating classroom model for our kindergarten students. We have 72 kindergartners, enough to hire four teachers, but only have room for three dedicated classrooms. We have temporary cubicle walls in the opened shared instructional space for our fourth kinder teacher to facilitate what the district considers to be small group instruction. However, this small group consists of 15, five and six year old children and is held in what truly is effectively the hallway due to the open design of our shared space areas. Muir is one of only three Title I schools in the district. Title I schools have a higher number of students that qualify and need additional academic support. Muir's student demographics require that we have five safety net teachers, whereas most schools have one at most. We also have two ELL teachers who work with over 25% of our students. These seven teachers gave up one of their classrooms this year and now share a single classroom for all safety net and ELL services, which does impact over a third of our student population. We need learning space not only for our kinder students, but appropriate space for our students receiving ELL and safety net services, which is a much higher number than most elementary schools. Mir is the only Title I school that has not received approval to add portable classrooms when requested. Our school has functioned at 84% or greater building capacity for the past two years and above 74% for four years now. In comparison with other Title I schools within the, the Lake Washington School District, Einstein received a portable in 2010 when they reached 76% capacity. Frost received a portable in 2015 at 73% capacity. To compare within the Juanita Learning Community, Keller Elementary, who also opened a rebuild in 2012 like Mir, received a portable last year with their enrollment at 79% capacity. Muir Elementary has a clear demonstrated need for additional classroom space now, not later. Muir's needs have been repeatedly, repeatedly overlooked during the process of how or why schools receive portable classrooms. On behalf of the families in PTSA, some of which are here tonight at John Muir Elementary, I respectfully request that the Lake Washington School Board and district officials reevaluate Muir's urgent need for classroom space and find funding available to place two portable classrooms at Muir during this 2017-2018 school year. Thank you. Well done on the three minutes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Catherine O'Neill. Hello, my name is Catherine O'Neill. I'm also from the Juanita Learning Area. And I am a John Muir Elementary School parent with a second grader. And my little one just starting her scholarly journey, she is in kindergarten. I must say I was shocked last year when to see the, the floating classroom in the hallway set up outside the kindergarten classrooms. Upon further investigation this year, I was informed that our school had been without necessary portables for at least two years, although they had been requested for quite some time. I have been awestruck by the teamwork of the staff and teachers to make do in this substandard situation. However, a classroom in a hallway is a huge detriment to the children trying to focus and learn in that space, as well as students trying to focus and learn in the area surrounding that space. My second grader has commented on hearing the students in the floating classroom. My kids call it the hallway classroom. Uh, and my kindergartner has commented on all the people that pass by as she's in her 15 person group trying to learn in this situation. Clearly, this space provides no semblance of a dedicated classroom. As you know, John Muir has a significant population of ELL and safety net students. And it makes me wonder, how would a child with any learn, learning challenges focus in this current setup? How can students of, at JME succeed in this situation? With our uniquely diverse population, it does feel as though the school district and the school board have chosen to overlook our school. Is it possible that because the parents of JME do not communicate with the same veracity as parents from other schools that we have just been pushed aside? I am here tonight with these other parents to be a voice for all of the parents, students, and the community members that cannot be here. I am standing here not just for my children, but for all JME students. With the, with the hurdles many of our students have to overcome, 
They need the best learning environment, not in a year or a few years, but right now. As you all are the leaders in our richly diverse community, we look to you to advocate and act for those that cannot do so for themselves. I trust that you, our elected officials, will protect the education of the young people in our community. I hope you have not only heard what we have said, but will move to action for the students. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, now, uh, Heather McCurley or McCuvely? Okay. Hi, how are you all today? Good. Um, I get emails from you guys regularly, so I feel like I know you all, but I'm sure you do not know me. Um, what I'm here to speak about today is the uh, boundary decision regarding the 232nd corridor, which is um, off of Union Hill. Um, in our community, the boundary decision has um, become and marked our community into an island bounded by um, two sides by Dickinson and one sided by Al Alcott. Um, in addition to uh, losing our um, neighborhood to Dickinson, um, we also have uh, several individuals or families that go to explore in the community, so we're also being um, split up from that area as well. Um, so I trust that you guys, I know you guys have a hard job and it is a difficult decision, um, but I also want to make sure that I'm here personally and not just as a click from a survey or a, an email, but to let you guys know how this impacts us. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next we've got uh, Nate Snodgrass. Hi, my name is Nate Snodgrass. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Uh, my daughter, Eliana, my son, Ethan, uh, they both go to Dickinson Elementary. I'm also here to talk about the decision on the 232nd corridor, just as Heather was speaking. My wife volunteers at the school. She teaches art smart. My mother-in-law also volunteers at the school. I'm a watchdog. We also coach basketball and soccer for Dickinson, so we are extremely invested in the Dickinson community, and we hope we're still there when our littlest goes there as well. Um, so we live in the same corridor as Heather. A little bit of background on it, because I'm gonna talk more about numbers. Uh, we're, ours is a small 35 house community as part of the larger 232nd corridor. Our corridor typically sends 10 students each to the different levels, so 10 to elementary, 10 to middle, 10 to high school, although it depends on how many high school students variance. Based on those numbers, we think we fit within the current capacity plans that we've seen for both Dickinson and Evergreen. So the five-year numbers that I've seen would put Dickinson at 436 versus a capacity of 461, which we would fit within just fine. Evergreen, same story. Our neighborhood also is not growing, so unlike other neighborhoods within the area, there's a moratorium on subdivisions. So while you may see the occasional house pop up from an acre lot that gets cleared off, there's no new building happening, and if you ever look on Zillow, the houses aren't really selling either, so growth is actually slowing down rather than speeding up. Eastlake, I know, it's a problem, but our volume is basically a rounding error when you look at the overcrowding problem and the overall capacity of that school. When you talk five to 10 students, that's roughly half of a percent of the overall enrollment. And so you would move kids out of the schools that they attend now to trade four years of an overcrowding problem that this doesn't solve in exchange for eight years where they can stay, where eight or nine years where they can stay with their friends. Conversely, Regiment Ridge is blowing up. All you need to do is drive around there to see the growth. There's also a 481 unit multifamily housing project that's going in next to the school. Those of us in our community think you're under projecting the volume that would go there, but nevertheless, um, I don't wanna debate the numbers that you see with that, but what my point is more to say, we believe that we fit within the capacity plans for the schools that our kids are already going to, and we would plead with you to let us stay within those schools and not disrupt where our kids are going in the community they're involved in for what I don't believe and we don't believe is actually solving the real problem, which is the overcrowding at Eastlake. I think we need to come up with a real solution for that problem, and I think we have the time to do it. Um, 
look, I don't envy your job, I know it's hard. You have a bunch of different parents like myself coming up to tell us how you're doing your job wrong and that you needed to go with what we want. So we appreciate the time and the consideration and uh, we look forward to the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Aaron Snodgrass? Hi, I'm Aaron Snodgrass, and um, this is my uniform because I just got done coaching kindergarten basketball. And so in um, using the same adage that I do with my son, I'm still proud of you as long as you've given your best. I'm here to kind of give my best. So if they ask me, well, why do we have to switch schools? I'll say, well, I tried my hardest. So that's why I'm here tonight. Um, anyway, um, along with Heather and Nate's uh, opinions about we're right now at Dickinson, we're off 232nd in the 232nd corridor. I just wanted to touch base on the um, mileage and the distance. So currently, if we were to go to the new Redmond Ridge Elementary School, that's actually the fourth closest or furthest away school for us. First is Dickinson is closest, second Rosa Parks, third Alcott, fourth is the new Redmond Ridge Elementary School. And so I've driven it, and it's taken 11 minutes to the new Redmond Ridge Elementary School. It takes me six minutes to Dickinson, and the mileage is actually 2.4 from my house to Dickinson, and it's 4.5 to Redmond Ridge East. It's just a really back route because there's no direct way from Union Hill. Um, so our concern is now they are a 30-minute bus ride to Dickinson. What, it, what would it look like to the new Redmond Ridge East with given the bus driver shortages and some are, you know, some bus drivers are driving two routes and now we're almost double the mileage away. Um, so that's uh, one of the concerns. And then the addition is that when they're so far away, we touched on the community piece, but basically they leave and then they never, after school, they won't see anyone else from their school community near their home at all because we will literally be surrounded by Dickinson, Alcott, and Rosa Parks. So our last ask is if we cannot be at Dickinson, we would love to be at Rosa Parks because we can at least can create some sort of community there, either through there's walking trails we can get to Rosa Parks from, there's, um, we, we ride our bikes through there, there's people we can see, we can actually get to the school on foot. Um, so that's our ask if we can't be at Dickinson that we're somewhere close within that top three distance. Okay. So thanks so much, I do not envy your job and I appreciate your listening, thank you. Thank you. Just to finish the 232nd corridor, I'm gonna move Molly Novak up. Molly? Good evening, I am Molly Novak. I'm the mother of six boys, and I have been at Dickinson for the last four years. I have 13 more years in the elementary school um, system. Three of the last three years, I have been uh, spent in countless hours leading the Dickinson Explorer PTSA as president and executive vice president. I'm here to talk to you about my concerns regarding the proposed boundaries around 232nd community. With the given proposals, we are being sent to the new Redmond Ridge Elementary School, which will require our children to be bused past Rosa Parks and I'm asking you to rethink our placement and consider Rosa Parks if Dickinson is not available, uh, or if Dickinson's not available. We know it's possible as it was an option proposed in um, option B. The closest park to us is in Redmond Ridge. We often find ourselves playing with children from Rosa Parks. Moving to Redmond Ridge Elementary is not building community, which was one of the main goals given to the committee in reboundering. Friendships also um, play a key role with Rosa Parks uh, would be a better fit. Our kids play ba baseball, soccer, and ride bikes with students at Rosa Parks. They will have um, built-in friendships at Rosa Parks. Most of the kids um, being moved have been at Dickinson Elementary since kindergarten, making this an already difficult transition. As we, uh, I was assured all feedback would be read 
and considered, yet I fail to see any adjustments made in the proposed um, boundary options for tonight, despite our community's feedback. Moving to a school so far away from our neighborhood would give me cause to rethink my vote on the bond and levy in the future, and my neighbors too. Thank you. Okay, on to a different group. Um, Jing Zhao, please. Yeah, but you didn't sign up. I did. Not under 232nd or Dickinson. Oh, wait a minute, Jess? Yeah, come on, Jess. Let's finish this out. So, I'm a big mouth. I yell from the back. My name is Jess Goodrich. I'm brand new to Washington, brand new to this kind of setting. And I have a kids in Dickinson, and we can walk to Rosa Parks. We live on 232nd, it's 1.3 miles away. We, they could walk home alone if I couldn't get there because the roads are that safe. It's walking trails and, and residential areas that are safe. And if we are sent to Redmond Ridge, they're gonna be wasting their time on a bus, creating more congestion through that area than there needs to be. And I think that that's the, no one has mentioned safety yet. There's a lot of safety if you can walk your kids to school on calm roads rather than having everybody driving or everybody taking the bus. Um, so that is a big deal to me. And then Molly gave me some notes. Let's see. Um, so 80th and 232nd, if they went to Rosa Parks, it'd be 85 more kids. It'd be up to like 95th percent instead of 80%. Apparently, that's really problematic. <laughs> but we didn't, we thought, you know, if it's not, pro if there are enough classrooms, then we'd be willing to deal with that rather than having a longer commute and creating more congestion. Um, also, like they were saying that this, there's gonna be more growth than perhaps is estimated. And so if that happens, the second part of that is the boundaries will have to be redrawn, we'll have to go back to another community and your feedback loops. I mean, you're gonna have to do it again. So keep us where we are, please, um, or put us in Rosa Parks where, it really is an issue to have this area where we could go there safely on foot. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll switch over to the Rockwell boundary. So, Jing, Zhao. Good evening. My name's Jing. I sent some email this afternoon, so I hope the face recognition doesn't do me too much that damage. Um, um, my daughter is in third grade, and my second one is only two months old, so it's still a long way for me to go. Um, so our home is on the west side of 202. So the, 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 our, right now the home school is Rockwell. If the boundary scenario A move us from uh, Rockwell to the North Redmond, it's really more than double the distance. Actually, a much longer because the 202, the traffic on 202 is really already one of the worst during the traffic hour, during the rush hour. So when I look at the um, boundary map, I'm, uh, the, the, the right now, the fi final boundary recommendation, I'm really wondering why uh, the Greystone on the north of Rockwell, um, they are much closer to Red, uh, North Redmond. And we, and we have to go all the way, they stay in the Rockwell and we have to go all the way to the North Redmond, bypass them uh, to the new school for a much more traffic time. And uh, so I, I went to the study session. I heard that the, the main reason for um, Greystone stay in Rockwell because many of them walk to, can walk to the school. So um, I understand that for to keep them maintain the same transportation uh, style and keep less of the car from the street. Um, but really, I'm really wondering about the statistics. Really, how many of them really walk to the Rockwell? Because I have many friends in Greystone. They drive to. They drop off. To, because on the way to go to work, they, many of them drop off. And, um, and the, other, the other reason I heard that it's harder for them to walk to North Redmond, because for, for me to look at map, looks like about similar distance. They, 
I feel like they can walk to North Redmond. But I, I, it, it was said that it's harder, but I don't know really how much, whether it's how much longer for them to walk to North Redmond. That's really on the same side of the one, uh, 116. Um, so that's one for but our situation right now, the school bus for uh, Verona, Mon Mondavio side of, of us, um, it's right now the, the bus time already 35 minutes. I think because of the bus cannot turn left from our side to the 202, so they have to, no matter what, they have to go all the way down to the QFC, the movie theater, and turn around, go back. So right now it's already 35 minutes. So I really don't know if we go to North Redmond, how much longer for the bus stop, for the bus, school bus to stay. Because I see the distance, they will stay a lot longer for school bus to stay on 202. 202 is horrible during the rush hour. I so I want to know how much longer for the school bus. And the other one is like, um, I, I think majority of us still, we do pick up and drop, drop off, because that's from my observation in the morning, I see I think only one third of my neighbors really use the school bus. <laughs> so for us, I mean, we, for us stay on the, we basically more than double on the, the two to go north and south for the already congest, congested area, I think we increase a, a tens of more car time on, on the road. So I, I, from my personal opinion, Point of view, I think it's the best for us to sw swap with uh, the gray stone. I think that will reduce the total car time on the road um, and stay with exactly same, the same, keep the same number of families. So I think two community, we have about the same number of com uh, families. Yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Christine Bigdash. Thanks for listening tonight. My name is Christine Bickdash. I live in the Mondavio community, also west of 202. I have two children at Norman Rockwell, both in third and fourth grade. Um, I have similar concerns as Jing about the school boundaries, and uh, the proposed scenario now has us going to North Redmond Elementary, which is a significant hardship for us in terms of, of, of di more difficult transportation. So that's what I'd like to talk about. Um, we've heard the main criteria for Greystone particularly, staying at Rockwell is rocking, walking distance, though we really have not received or seen any facts and data on how many families in that community walk. What I'd like for you to hear tonight is our data and our facts on how long our children are on the bus and how much longer they'll be on the bus and how much longer we'll be in the cars. So um, our children are picked up at 7.55 in the morning right now. They stay on the bus for 35 minutes. They must, as Jing said, go all the way down to Bella Bottega and turn around and come back. In the new scenario, they won't be picking up any children down in the Avignon community. They'll actually just go down there and turn around and come back, but will be at least another 10 minutes for them to get to school. That's 45 minutes for our most vulnerable and young children. For us in the evenings to come pick up our students, if they are in after school care that's sponsored by the district, that is the most difficult commute in most of Redmond, I believe, um, barring maybe Novelty Hill Road. Um, and it will at least take us an extra 20 to 25 minutes. You might be looking at a mile or two miles in distance, but by car, I can tell you by Every single night, it's just it's horrific traffic. Even trying to get to 60 Acres, which is where my kid goes to soccer, it's horrible. <laughs> so um, evening pickups will also be worse, and there'll be just more transportation and you know traffic and congestion on the roads. So I ask that you guys, when you're looking at this and potentially thinking about different uh, modifications to the proposal, look at the number of families that are in Von Mondavio, the Mondavio townhomes, the Verona single family homes, and potentially even hidden uh, the Valley Estates community, which is all west of 202, and potentially swapping with the Greystone community. They are much, much closer to the new school than we are. And so, um, and please, it would be great if for transparency purposes, we were given some of this facts and data on how long the transportation um, would take our children so that we could choose an option that would, we could support as a community. So thank you again for listening. Thank you. Okay, Purnima Shankar. <coughs> Hi, my name is Purnima Shankar. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I will make it easy on everybody since uh, Christine and um, uh, addressed all the concerns that I had. I had similar concerns uh, about transportation and uh, spending a long time in the bus in the mornings and then deciding to um, stop taking the bus and drop off my kids uh, 
uh, by car, and that's even worse in the mornings because of the traffic in 202. I live in the same community as Christine and had the same concerns, so uh, I request that you kindly reconsider and uh, uh, consider swapping our community with uh, the Greystone community. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, Simone Valderez. Okay. Because I think my concerns have been uh, raised by my neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's the end of the people who uh, signed up before I grabbed the sheets. Um, I thank you. Now, um, as our meeting goes on, there is a section that's going to be very relevant for everyone except for our uh, Muir folks. The Muir folks, uh, we want to talk to you guys offline at other times. Um, that's a conversation. I hope you've already talked to Nancy. I suspect you have. But uh, it's definitely something that, if there's a way, there's a will. But we don't know if there's a way yet. All right, so um, for the rest of you who have been speaking to the boundary issues, um, let's say that your two neighborhoods, there are a number of other neighborhoods we've heard of, heard from through email who are dissatisfied with various other aspects of the process. This is one of the least pleasant parts of being on a school board. Um, just to be honest. But please do stick around because John is going to be giving us the, not just the, here is the map, but here is the rationale for each of the pieces of the map as we go through this. And the only thing I can say that uh, there are going to be some people who are disappointed at the end. This is always the case. I've been these people. That said, it beats the heck out of overcrowding. So thank goodness we were able to build a couple of new schools. And I apologize to those of you who at the end are going to be able to say, gosh, you know, I, I didn't wind up with what I wanted. What you really wanted was to get out of a school that was 110%, and that will be the case for everyone. So with that, um, we'll move on. So please do stick around. We've got a big presentation that you should see. Um, a couple of you were here. There's a full version of that that will be, will be coming up. In the meantime, we're on to the consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Right, so moved. Second. Moved by Director Liberty, seconded by Director Bliesner. Um, Dr. Pierce, will you please pull, pull the board? Nancy. Yeah. Eric? Yes. Chris? Yes. Mark? Yes. Siri? Yes. Okay, um, and Dr. Pierce, as usual, will you please review the donations? Yes, we have a significant number of donations this evening, uh, totaling $298,313, rounding to the nearest dollar. So I, since there are so many, I will read uh, quickly. We've got 3000 from the Lake Washington Schools Foundation to Inglewood Middle uh, for reading inventory software, 15482 from Alcott, Elementary PTSA to Alcott Elementary for uh, uh, stipends for music running club cup stacking and uh, to support field trips. $1,534, excuse me, from John James Audubon Elementary, PTSA to Audubon Elementary to provide a stipend for choir. $12,000 from Elizabeth Blackwell PTSA to Blackwell Elementary for a variety of things including Classroom enrichment library equipment, uh, site licenses for math and reading enrichment library books, uh, and field trips. $3,014 from Dickinson PTSA to Dickinson Elementary to purchase netbooks. $3,000 from Barbara and Christopher Kaler to Emerson K-12 to purchase classroom supplies. $25,364 from Ben Franklin PTA to Franklin Elementary for a variety of things, including stipends for outdoor ed and choir, uh, field trips, and classroom enrichment. $1,534 from Robert Frost PTSA to Frost Elementary for stipend for choir. $19,445 from Horace Mann Elementary PTSA to Mann Elementary for a variety of stipends for safety patrol, choir, uh, reading enrichment and uh, field trips. $17,407 from the Juanita Schools Foundation to Juanita Elementary for stipends for choir computer science support, for accelerated reader and IXL math, and for their volunteer program. $22,584 from Lakeview Elementary, PTSA to Lakeview Elementary 
for stipends for Homework Club, Math Olympiad, Xeno Math, STEM Choir, uh, for student fee waivers, and for classroom supplies and printing services. $4,363 from Krista McAuliffe PTSA to McAuliffe Elementary for playground equipment. $7,344 from Margaret Mead PTSA to Mead Elementary for stipends for Ultimate Frisbee, online music, excuse me, music, online math enrichment, and Operation School Bell. 1,253 from Redmond Elementary PTSA to Redmond L to purchase reading enrichment site licenses. $10,000 from Simon and Masako Guest to Rose Hill Elementary to support robotics. 5,400 from Smith PTSA to Smith Elementary for field trips. 8,892 from Thoreau Elementary PTA to Thoreau Elementary for stipends for choir, outdoor ed, and for professional development. 6,290 sorry, $6,269 from Twain PTSA to Twain Elementary for classroom enrichment and homework club. <laughs> I'm going as fast as I, it's a problem. great problem to have. Isn't it? It's not a problem, it's wonderful. Uh, $41,091 from Laura Ingalls Wilder, PTSA to Wilder Elementary for stipends for Math Olympiad, Math Club, Motor Skills Enrichment, Student Council Safety Patrol, for library books, for IXL Math, for field trips, and staff development. 17,150 from Environmental and Adventure School PTO to ESA to support field trips and extracurricular activities. $16,083 from North Star Parent Fund to North Star Middle for stipends for yearbook music, extracurricular activities, and for classroom supplies. 1,500 from Redmond Middle School PTSA to Redmond Middle to purchase library books. 21,000 from Renaissance PTSA to Renaissance Middle for student fee waivers, classroom supplies, classroom enrichment, and extracurricular activities. $20,917 from Stella Scola PTO to Stella Scola for stipends for Latin 3 and 4. $4,934 from Juanita Rebels Booster Club to Juanita High School to purchase baseball uniforms. $3,429 from Lake Washington High School Dance Team Booster Club to Lake Washington High School to provide stipends for dance team. $2,000 from Lake Washington High School PTSA to Lake Washington High School to support back to school barbecue. And finally, $2,324 from Mustangs Cheer Boosters to Redmond High School to provide a stipend for extracurricular activities. So I think that's actually the largest list I've ever read. And uh, the total this evening is $298,313 and very generous donations from a variety of PTSAs and booster clubs and individuals to many, many of our schools. So we're very grateful. That truly is the longest that we've ever had. And we always take the time to read it because we want to say thank you. Um, and ironically, with a very long list, this is one of the first times I've had anything other than a camera and five staff members to actually say thank you to parents in our district who do support these activities. Your support is huge to us, and we hear it. We hear you. We know. We do. We've been there. We've been PTA presidents. We've won the Golden Nut Award, that sort of craziness. Um, Acorn. Acorn, sorry. Um, <laughs> my wife, she's the one who won the Golden Nut, so I'm still bitter. Um, Anyway, uh, our, uh, we really do appreciate the generosity of our parents and our community, and uh, we want to thank you um, for all of your support. So with that, let's get to the main event that our audience is interested in. Uh, we are on to the non-consent agenda, and our first item on the non-consent agenda is the boundary process and recommendation. So, Dr. Pierce. Great. So uh, if you could turn to tab eight, uh, we have the situation and recommendation. And just as a reminder, the board uh, is not, we're not recommending that the board take final action this evening. Uh, tonight is our opportunity to present the final recommendation to the board. Uh, then there's still a bit of uh, comment and feedback. And uh, we're requesting that the board take formal action at the November 20th board meeting. So just a little bit of background while John is bringing up the presentation and I'll reference um, the situation recommendation sheet on uh, tab eight. 
A boundary committee was formed in January 2017 with the purpose of recommending school attendance areas. The district, as you know, uh, is building two elementary schools and a new middle school in the Redmond area. And the boundary committee was charged with drawing attendance boundaries for these new schools and to distribute enrollment across the learning community. Parents provided feedback throughout the entire process on the criteria used by the committee and proposed scenarios. At the May Open House, the Boundary Committee presented three scenarios to the community for review and feedback. Public comment was available from May 4th through the 19th. The committee reviewed community feedback and made adjustments to meet the committee's charge and to align with the boundary criteria. Four scenarios were developed and presented to the community in September. Public comment was open from September 26th through October 2nd. After continued review and analysis, the Boundary Committee then published two revised scenarios in an online open house that began on October 25th. Public comment was available from October 25th through October 30th. Finally, the Boundary Committee analyzed and reviewed all feedback from the online open house in order to develop their final recommendation. The Boundary Committee's final recommendation was based on alignment with our stated boundary criteria. Uh, and also ensures enrollment is distributed across the Redmond area and did can take, take into consideration feedback from each comment period. Uh, the final rec recommendation was presented to me on November 3rd and I have uh, met with committee chair uh, John Holman as well as Barbara Posthumus um, throughout the entire process. So uh, I have taken all the input into consideration and tonight uh, I'm bringing a final recommendation to the board. Uh, the final recommendation includes boundary adjustments for new and current Redmond area elementary schools, boundary adjustments for new and current Redmond area middle schools, boundary adjustments for Redmond and East Lake High Schools, recommendation for program locations for elementary and middle school quest and choice schools, uh, as well as taking into consideration other program placements such as learning center programs. Also, you'll see in the recommendation this evening, recommendations for grandfathering. So again, that's the situation. Recommendation is for the board to take formal action on November 20th. So with that, uh, I want to say a couple more things before I, I turn it over to John. First and foremost, I want to um, just highlight the fact uh, that boundary adjustments are not an easy process. And uh, even when, you know, we have done, this is now my six year superintendent, and I believe this is our fifth boundary adjustment in six years um, due to our continued growth. And uh, however, I will say this is the first boundary adjustment where we're actually doing an adjustment in order to fill new schools, which is a wonderful thing. And through the support of our community, we're able to build the new schools uh, because the passage of the 2016 bond measure, which is the first of four planned bonds in order to address our enrollment uh, across the district. So we do have a long-term plan. Long-term plan was developed by the community. Uh, we are uh, happy to begin to implement that long-term plan, which involves building new schools. And whenever we're building new schools, of course, boundary adjustments must follow. So uh, I wanna say a big thank you to John and the entire boundary committee that um, has been working through this process, also to, um, to uh, Barbara and to Jeff Miles, who are uh, part of the Boundary Committee and also district staff, uh, because it's not been easy. Um, the uh, committee has worked tirelessly over uh, this, you know, it's been a, a two year, a two school year um, time frame that this process has been going on. So I just wanna say thank you for, uh, for all of your work and efforts. So with that, um, we will get started on the formal presentation. I'll highlight just a couple things and then turn it over to John. So when this process first began, uh, as uh, the board had a conversation about um, ensuring that we're approaching this work and leading with equity. So we do have boundary criteria that we follow and we'll get to that in just a moment. And it's also important, and it was important, this was our first uh, piece of community feedback when we um, asked the community to rank order the boundary criteria. And we wanted to make sure that in that um, process, we were also leading with equity and telling people and um, of our commitment to providing high quality education to all students, regardless of what school students attend. Uh, we are a public school system. We do serve a diverse student body, and we value the diversity in our community, um, the race and ethnicity 
uh, that we um, have represented in our student body and our parent community. Also, uh, diversity in terms of gender and ability and socioeconomic status. And uh, when we open new schools and determine uh, those attendance boundaries, you know, we're bound not to cause um, imbalance um, or segregate our schools. And uh, we also wanted to take an opportunity anytime we're looking at boundary in order to provide as much balance as possible. So whereas potentially some previous boundary mm -hmm. processes before uh, all of our time uh, resulted in some um, imbalance in terms of uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, whenever we're doing a boundary process, we are looking at all of those aspects and really leading with that. That being said, we've got specific ground boundary criteria that we share uh, with the community and we ask the community to provide um, input in terms of rank ordering. So that criteria that is continues to be the lens through which the boundary committee um, examines different scenarios is what you see here on the screen. We do attempt to maintain neighborhoods to the extent possible, minimize the number of students and families affected, knowing that uh, in this process in particular, um, since we're filling, for example, two elementary schools, that um, the number of students affected are going to be far greater than you've seen in prior boundary processes. We do. Uh, our, our goal is to redistribute enrollment to match school capacity to accommodate growth, um, to minimize transportation impacts, to use natural boundaries to the extent possible, and to provide proximity for special programs to the extent possible. Now, uh, using each of these criteria, Chris, you actually had a, a great um, description of the complexity of this work in the study session. And now, of course, I didn't write down what you said, but you said it's a multivariable. It's a multidimensional um, jigsaw puzzle. Multidimensional jigsaw puzzle. And that's really what this process is, because uh, when you uh, take a look at one criteria in um, isolation, it potentially has impacts to all the other criteria. So it's a continual refinement process um, that the Boundary Committee uses to develop um, the best, you know, recommendation that most meets the prioritized criteria. So the task of the Boundary Committee was to analyze the attendance areas of the schools possibly affected by new schools and our um, current overcrowding and to develop a final recommendation that provides necessary changes to school attendance areas in order to redistribute students to existing schools, to draw the attendance boundaries for the new schools, and to place district programs in choice schools. And so I just want to highlight that aspect for a moment because that kind of um, contributes to the complexity of the process. In past boundary processes, uh, looking at program placement was not integral to that process. And we heard feedback, if the board will recall, about um, the impact of you know, making those program decisions following the boundary instead of within the context of the boundary. So uh, taking into consideration that feedback this time around with the boundary process, we actually, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Essentially combined um, progr the program placement process with the boundary process. So we weren't letting one of those things drive the other, but looking at them as a whole. And that was based on feedback received during the last process. So with that, it was a big task. <laughs> um, there is a defined timeline for this work, obviously, because it needs to um, be completed so we can uh, open the new schools and have students in those new schools. So with that, I will uh, now turn it over to John. As you know, Dr. Coleman uh, led the boundary process. And um, thanks, John, for all your work. And you can take it away. Great. And I'll just add that to that multivariable jigsaw puzzle is overlaid with students and families that are committed to their schools, that love their schools, and uh, the Boundary Committee, that's the first thing we talked about when we met this year was, um, we know that what we're going through, it's numbers and boundary lines and all of that, but at the end of the day, we know that we're gonna ask families to change that they're gonna have to go to new schools and uh, we understand that um, and we appreciate that about our community. Um, I feel honored to go through this process with our community. I know it's not easy for uh, the committee. I know it's not easy for families, um, but we take this work very seriously knowing the impact it has 
And also it's a huge celebration for us knowing that we're opening new schools, which we thank our community for funding those for us. It shows the commitment they have to our district and our kids and our future. So um, with that, I'll go through uh, the recommendation. Um, Redmond area schools, um, all Redmond area schools are affected by this boundary process, elementary, middle, um, and our high schools, both Redmond and East Lake High School. You've seen this visual a number of times. It just kind of defined the process when we started uh, last December and all the way to today. That's um, that second to the last uh, star you see there uh, in November. And we always try and get our boundary processes done prior to our registration. Um, kindergarten registration is kind of that first launch, um, knowing that we need uh, necessary information so that we can plan for the next school year. Dr. Pierce outlined a lot of the community engagement uh, opportunities that uh, we've had throughout this process. As a committee, we learned a significant amount um, about the Redmond area uh, in order to come up with our final recommendation. Just wanna highlight the presentation outline uh, so you know what to expect. I do wanna cover current capacity and enrollment I want to talk about the community input and just a little bit about the October 25th to 30th uh, input we received. And then I'm going to go through the recommendation at each level, elementary, middle school, and high school. I uh, want to review the implement implementation timeline for each of the recommendations, talk about grandfathering, talk about variance considerations, and then wrap up with communication and transition planning. And so talking about capacity and enrollment, we know that student enrollment in the Redmond area is growing. That's why the 2016 bond was so critical to add uh, three new schools in the Redmond area. Uh, we know that all of our elementary schools are projected to be over capacity, that both of the middle schools in the Redmond area are projected to be over capacity, and that both Redmond and East Lake High School have that same projection. So part of the solution was the 2016 bond, uh, adding two new elementary schools in the Redmond area, then the one new uh, middle school in the Redmond area to open in the fall of 2019. But there's also the longer term plan that um, I'll touch on a few, few times throughout the presentation. On the 2018 bond is a choice high school that would be located in Sammamish. Uh, and one of the uh, reasons where we have uh, a choice high school on the 2018 bond is to draw enrollment from both Eastlake and Redmond high schools. This is a data view you've seen a number of times and it just demonstrates on that far right column uh, the number of available classrooms currently and it shows many of our schools are operating over and significantly over capacity right now. And in order to do that, that means they're giving up things like art and science rooms, they're reducing the standard of service, meaning they're giving up uh, resource classrooms so that they're uh, needing to provide that small group instruction differently. Uh, possibly they're consolidating music. Pro There's lots of different ways that uh, schools reduce the standard of service to be able to implement uh, K-5 classrooms, and then there, we also have grade level teachers um, where, that you heard uh, spoken about tonight uh, from John Muir. Our middle school capacity, currently uh, Evergreen Middle School is over capacity and Redmond Middle School is uh, just under uh, capacity, but projected to be over in just the next few years. And Eastlake High School and Redmond High School, currently both under capacity, but projected to continue growing um, as our larger grade levels move through the system. So I wanna to touch on community input and community engagement. Uh, we do work to communicate throughout the entire process with the community around next steps, what we're thinking, uh, provide scenarios. And we started the process with a press release to announce the launch of the, the boundary process. We have a boundary website that we keep up to date. We have direct email communication that we provide to the community. We have a let's talk uh, section where questions can be asked and uh, answers provided. Um, and then our uh, 
building principals provide information in their school newsletters. And on the right-hand side there, you can see the different engagement opportunities that we had with the community spoken about previously. Dr. Pierce outlined each of these, just a little more detail with uh, three scenarios at the elementary and middle school in May 4 for all three levels in September, narrowed down to two in October, and then our final recommendation is brought forward tonight. From the October 25th through 30th online open house, where the community received two scenarios to provide feedback, overall support um, was provided for both scenarios A and B. When we looked at uh, where the feedback was coming from, when we looked at the east, uh, east side of the district, uh, schools Alcott, Dickinson, uh, Wilder, and who am I forgetting here? And Rosa Parks, thank you. Um, showed uh, greater support for scenario B, where the west side of the Redmond area um, had a preference for scenario A, which caused the committee then to uh, dig deeper to understand uh, what that feedback was telling us, knowing that uh, even with the feedback, there were uh, challenging decisions that were gonna have to be made in order to develop a recommendation. And so the elementary recommendation. And so with this data display, I think the, uh, a couple of uh, data points I wanna point out. One is the far right column. Uh, this recommendation has all of our schools either at or under capacity, uh, meaning that we have distributed enrollment throughout uh, the Redmond area. Another uh, two areas I wanna point out is the portable column, uh, showing that there's 52 portables in the Redmond area, and with only 19 classrooms remaining in 21-22, that means Redmond schools are needing to continue to use 30 uh, portable classrooms to implement this recommendation. And so while we're working towards reducing our over-reliance on portables, uh, this is step one, and with our long-term uh, facilities plan, there's actually another uh, Redmond area elementary that would uh, continue to mitigate the use of portables. Here you can see with the implementation John, of- John, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just to, be, um, just to be completely clear, that is on one of the um, future plan bond measures. Yes. Yeah. Not the upcoming 2018. Thank you. Uh, here you can see with the implementation of this recommendation, uh, schools in 2018-19 uh, demonstrates that balanced enrollment across the Redmond area. And to dig into a little bit about uh, the recommendation, uh, there's a lot of information uh, that you've seen on the, the recommendation page, but I think uh, at a high level, all 10 elementary schools are affected in this recommendation. All schools are either receiving students or sending students. And I think that highlights the uh, situation that the Redmond area schools are in right now. Uh, when we look at Redmond Ridge East, uh, we, we know that the Redmond Ridge East area uh, houses about 300 students right now that are currently uh, associated or aligned at Wilder. And so uh, once they uh, uh, get reboundaried to Redmond Ridge East Elementary, uh, that caused a situation where Redmond Ridge East was now 300 students and Wilder was 300 students. 300 students, and that was one of the things that the committee looked at, knowing that we wanted our uh, schools to have a larger neighborhood community than just 300 students. And so uh, that those are some of the things that we, uh, decisions we had to make when looking at the east side of the Redmond area was to uh, identify areas and neighborhoods to associate both with Redmond Ridge East and Wilder. And so you can see both under Redmond Ridge East, the areas we identified in Wilder, uh, the area uh, north of Novelty Hill called Westchester, uh, that now in our recommendation aligns with Wilder. Um, in North Redmond, uh, 
it was it was interesting learning North Redmond uh, through this process uh, because it is uh, very intertwined. Uh, the neighborhoods are very connected, and so um, I think as a committee we worked to understand those areas and came up with a recommendation um, that provides boundary lines between Einstein, North Redmond, and Rockwell uh, that makes sense. Uh, you heard a uh, comment tonight about areas on 202, and thank you for making those. Uh, we definitely talked about those areas uh, to great extent. Uh, one of the uh, reasons we did recommend to align those areas with North Redmond was the uh, issue of transportation, uh, the areas of Greystone, and I'm forgetting the other area closest to Rockwell in that northern area. Uh, they are within the walking boundary, uh, and so we know that there are families that select to walk and we know that there's families that select to drive. The areas along 202, uh, they would be provided a bus regardless. And so uh, that was one of the decision points in looking at that, knowing that those students would be on a bus, uh, whether they went to Rockwell or to North Redmond. And so uh, you can see the determination from the committee was to align them with North Redmond. Um, Another area that uh, uh, under great discussion was the areas of west of 166. Currently their man uh, attendance area and knowing that man was in a situation where uh, with no, even with no uh, students entering the school uh, from a boundary adjustment, there had to be a change at man because they're currently over capacity and uh, to get them within their capacity numbers, uh, we had to make a change. As a committee, we looked at another, a number of options. Uh, the area we selected west of 166 is within the walk, uh, the mile walk area for Rockwell. Another area that we considered uh, would move current walkers to riding a bus, so that was a consideration we made. We also looked at program at Mann Elementary. They currently have uh, learning center programs there, and so the determination, uh, before I get to that, um, even with moving the learning center program, a neighborhood would have to be moved from Mann to get them within capacity. So a program change didn't resolve uh, the capacity challenge at Mann, and so you can see our recommendation was to move that entire area west of 166. So as Dr. Pierce uh, talked about, uh, not only are we identifying neighborhood recommendations for this boundary adjustment, we also took into consider consideration the different programs uh, that our schools house. And so uh, you can see here, uh, the recommendation is to maintain Quest programs at Alcott, Einstein, Redmond Elementary, and Rosa Parks Elementary schools. Uh, currently, Alcott has seven classrooms uh, Redmond Elementary has 10 classrooms of Quest. Einstein and Rosa Parks each have one classroom. Uh, the recommendation is to uh, reduce the Alcott and Redmond Quest programs, but to uh, definitely maintain some level of Quest service at those schools. But additionally, our uh, recommendation is to locate Quest programs at Wilder, North Redmond, and Redmond Ridge East Elementary schools where our recommendation is to maintain special education programs at all current uh, locations and to locate new choice programs at Einstein and North Redmond Elementary schools. Some of the impacts of the elementary recommendation. What this does is it does develop uh, neighborhood attendance areas for both our uh, two new elementary schools and all the elementary, current elementaries in the Redmond area. It ensures that all elementary schools in the Redmond area are projected to be at or under total capacity in the 21-22 school year. This recommendation does require all elementary schools in the Redmond area to experience change Recommendation is to maintain uh, learning and intervention center classrooms at Mann, Dickinson, Rosa Parks, and Redmond Elementary. The impact of this recommendation distributes Quest classrooms to seven of 10 elementary schools in the Redmond area. And I wanna highlight that as a key to this recommendation because uh, what we know is transportation is 
is a challenge. And by having more Quest classrooms uh, throughout the learning community, it actually allows neighborhood students, more neighborhood students to attend uh, their Quest program at their neighborhood school so they can just take the bus with their peers. And it, there's not a transportation increase by uh, busing them to a different school. Our recommendation keeps current walking students as walkers and it increases choice school program availability for elementary students. One of the ways we look at uh, our recommendation is in uh, relationship to the criteria. And uh, I'll just kind of go through our recommendation. We do believe that neighborhoods are maintained to the greatest extent possible. We knew that by opening two new elementary schools, uh, our estimate was a minimum of 1,200 students would be affected by this boundary adjustment. You can see that uh, in total, 1,353 students are affected. There's a range of zero to four classrooms available uh, at all elementary schools. Again, it keeps current walking students walkers and actually reduces the maximum bus time with this recommendation. We did consider uh, natural barriers and man-made barriers uh, in our recommendation and special programs are located throughout the Redmond area. Board members, any comments or questions about the elementary portion before I move on to middle school? Okay. And so one of the things we received feedback on early in the process um, after, uh, the set, after the May uh, community feedback meetings was to think about our scenarios as, if you will, packages. So have an elementary uh, boundary uh, recommendation or scenario that related to a middle school scenario that related to a high school scenario. So that as uh, families and community members were giving feedback, they understood the, the, the whole picture, not just a, uh, one part of our uh, of a scenario but what would be the implication for their child uh, throughout their educational experience and so um, we we implemented that at the september community meetings um, and that's also how you're receiving the recommendation tonight the elementary uh, recommendation is in relation to the middle school which is in relation to the high school recommendation so john uh, i i apologize i i just want to briefly get something in before I lose too much more of my motivated audience. Tonight I did hear one thing that disturbs me. Um, in 2015, the Redmond Learning Community, having been through the elementaries, was by far our worst overcrowding problem across the whole district. The projects funded by the 2016 bond relieve that pressure. Schools in Kirkland are still busting at the seams. No matter how grumpy you are after the dust settles, you will be happier than if you did not have the new building. So on the behalf of the parents at Muir and Lakeview and Kirk and all of the western side of our district who are still bursting at the seams, please don't even consider linking your vote on the bond to how you feel about this final result of this, bond, of this boundary process. We are still stuck in a place where we would kill to have a reboundary process, no matter how grumpy we might be at the end of it. So please, 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 don't even say that, don't even think it, because it's kind of disrespectful for the other entire half of the district that hasn't got new schools and is still operating at 110% capacity. I just wanted to say that before I lost too many more of my audience members. Please continue with the middle school. And so with our rec recommendation, you can see in uh, school year 21-22, uh, our three middle schools are either below or just above uh, their capacity number. Uh, currently, Evergreen Middle School has, I believe, 12 portables. And with this, it would start reducing the reliance on portables at Evergreen. But I do want to be clear that at Redmond, there are currently six portables, and this recommendation uh, uses those portables uh, uh, to implement this recommendation. You'll also see here, uh, and we worked on these data sheets and, and 
in future boundary processes, I'm sure we'll continue to work on them. Under uh, proposed program use, there's a whole bunch of asterisks and some language below. I just wanna be clear about what all of this means. Um, with this recommendation, uh, Quest uh, students are able to attend their neighborhood school in the Redmond area, meaning Evergreen, Redmond, and Redmond Ridge Middle School will all have a Quest program. The 90 you see there under Evergreen are Inglewood Middle School Quest students that currently attend uh, their split at Evergreen and Redmond Middle. Uh, so in this recommendation, all Inglewood Middle School Quest students would attend uh, uh, Quest at Evergreen. You can also see there in the choice column, uh, there's some ads and some subtractions and I'll explain all of those with this recommendation and I'll speak uh, about this later as well. We are recommending uh, two new uh, choice schools or programs, one located at Evergreen Middle School, one located at Redmond Ridge Middle School. As you know, uh, at Redmond Ridge, we've identified that that will be a dual language immersion program. Uh, and as part of our uh, implementation of choice schools and programs, while it's to provide options, it's also to address issues of capacity. And so you can see here uh, at Redmond Middle School, we are uh, assuming a 125 student uh, 125 students would access uh, choice schools at Evergreen and Redmond Ridge and reducing their overall student capacity to 1,071 in 21-22. So I think that kind of gives the overview picture of this data slide just so uh, you have that information. And John, just, uh, just for the benefit of anybody who is here in the audience or watching from home, uh, because I know it came up during study session and we just clarified a little bit more. The reason there's an asterisk uh, next to Quest for Redmond and Redmond Ridge is if we had placed a number there, then we would be doubly counting their, the, the students because the Quest students are included in that 6-8 capacity needed. So that's why there's not a number there, and as John explained, the 90 number there at Evergreen, or excuse me, at Evergreen, those are, those are the Inglewood students. Right. So I just wanted to sort of say it again <laughs> to make you. sure anybody who's looking at that chart understands what we're trying to convey. All right, thank you. Thank you. And here you can see this is the implementation of our recommendation. I do wanna point out in year one of the new school opening, uh, Redmond Middle School uh, does see a increase in enrollment. That's due to the implementation of the choice schools and programs, uh, but you can see in 2021 uh, with the implementation of those programs, they're uh, within capacity. Maybe I'll just highlight one more thing around data. Um, when we looked at the different options for middle school boundaries, uh, Redmond Ridge at times was really close to that 900 capacity number. And uh, given our limitations with that site, uh, we felt like this recommendation um, allows for some uh, variation uh, in enrollment uh, over time, uh, given the, uh, the restrictions there. And so for our recommendation uh, for Redmond Middle School, uh, schools that would uh, attend Redmond Middle would be Redmond Elementary, Mann Elementary, Rockwell, the new elementary at North Redmond, and parts of Einstein, and those areas are west of Avondale, uh, excluding neighborhoods located on Avondale between Northeast 85th and 180th Avenue Northeast. Evergreen Middle School uh, would have Alcott, Dickinson, and parts of Einstein, those parts of Einstein that aren't going to Redmond Middle School. And then the new middle school at Redmond Ridge uh, would have Wilder Elementary, Rosa Parks, and Redmond Ridge uh, East. And so our program recommendation for the middle school is to maintain Quest programs at each of the Redmond area middle schools to locate all Inglewood Middle School Quest students at Evergreen Middle School, 
to maintain special education programs at all current locations. Currently, we have a transition center program at both Redmond Middle and Evergreen Middle. And we have an intervention center program at Evergreen Middle School. This recommendation also uh, proposes a transition center program at the new middle school at Redmond Ridge for their uh, neighborhood students that require that, that placement. Additionally, uh, this recommendation places new choice schools at Evergreen Middle School and at Redmond Ridge Middle School. When we think about the impacts, again, this recommendation develops uh, neighborhood attendance areas for our new middle school and our current uh, existing middle schools. It ensures that all of our middle schools are projected to be at or very close to their capacity in 2021-22 school year. This does require that both of our middle schools experience change. It maintains our transition and intervention center classrooms, as I just said. Uh, it provides capacity for uh, the new middle school at Redmond Ridge to house a transition center program. It allows Evergreen, Redmond, and Redmond Ridge Middle to provide Quest services for neighborhood students. It keeps walking students walkers, and I believe also actually increases the number of walkers with uh, the, new, uh, the new middle school. And it also increases choice school program availability for our middle school students. Again, when looking at the criteria, we do believe that we uh, maintain neighborhoods to the greatest extent possible. Knowing that we were opening a new middle school with a capacity of 900, and that we had two schools that were projected to be over capacity. Our estimate was a minimum of 900 students uh, affected. You can see here our recommendation is uh, 1,046. You can also see that the range of available capacity at our three middle schools with this recommendation are from 237 students under capacity at Evergreen Middle School to 13 students over capacity at Redmond Middle School. Again, it keeps current walkers walking. We did consider all of those natural and man-made barriers, and we do have special programs located throughout the Redmond area. Any questions or comments? I just have a quick question on the, um, if you can go back a slide, it'll be easier, thank you. So the range of available student capacity from 237 to over 13, why have a recommendation with that type of range in the capacity between the schools? Yeah, I think one of the reasons is um, that 237 uh, capacity, uh, a significant amount of that would be portable usage. Uh, so currently Evergreen Middle School has 12 portables and uh, so part of the um, long-term facility task force recommendation was overall to work towards reducing our over-reliance on portables. And so this is one way uh, to accomplish this. Uh, Evergreen Middle School is um, in the long-term facility plan to uh, be either rebuilt or, or enlarged. Uh, and so uh, those are the things that we considered. So, John, the uh, this the recommendation is increasing capacity for middle school quest in this district, in this region of the district. It is allowing for quest programs to be located at their neighborhood schools, okay. and so depending on, it allows them to flex depending on the number of students. Uh, we. I'll just give you our projected number. We estimated about 90 students per middle school, okay. knowing that that will ebb and flow. Right. And then the choice options are, in, I, I, that's always something I hear back on parents being enthused about, we want more choice, we want more choice. This roughly doubles the amount of middle school choice programs. Is that in terms of the number of students? Are you saying as a district? No, in that region. Just in the Redmond Learning Community, or I guess the eastern half so of the district. Kurt, go ahead. Yeah, so actually, um, when we uh, worked on a long term plan for growing choice to keep pace with the growth of the district, uh, we had uh, the first choice school in the Redmond region as a part of this process. That's the dual language. Then, as um, this process continued and we looked at potential options and went back to 
our choice school expansion plan, that's where the second mm -hmm. choice school. So currently there is no uh, Redmond Learning Community, Redmond Region Middle School choice program. So that's an infinity percent <laughs> increase. Okay, keep going. That's a fun number to say. Okay, now for the high school recommendation. And our high school recommendation comes in context of uh, a few different uh, action items. One is the boundary process. Two is our short-term plan to address capacity. Three is the long-term plan to address capacity. And so here on this data view, you can see that uh, that last, the second to last row is that New Choice High School, which would be located uh, in Sammamish. Uh, it'll be a student capacity of 600 students. That Choice School, yes, it provides options for our students, and it helps us to address issues of capacity at our uh, comprehensive high schools. And so you can see here, uh, we have total capacity at, uh, at our schools needed 912 capacity needed, uh, and this is in the 2022-23 school year, so this is a, a pretty long-term view here, but knowing that our, uh, our high schools are continuing to grow, and that means uh, East Lake High School is projected to be about four to 500 students over capacity here, and so part of the solution is an adjustment in East Lake attendance area, and so you can see the estimated of about 50 students, high school students, in the boundary change with the implementation of a new choice high school, uh, uh, which is on the 2018 bond, uh, we're estimating about 400 students from East Lake High School would attend, about 100 students from Redmond High School would attend, so you can see um, both are within uh, 69 or 30 students over capacity after the implementation of all of this. We've also identified some uh, interior uh, building modifications to increase scheduling efficiency so that uh, the, the students they have, they're actually able to schedule into classes. And so um, that's kind of the overview of this data view. Siri, did you have a? Just real quickly, does, do these numbers take into account our students who choose running start or choose any of the, in the junior or senior year? to how those numbers are projected. I'm gonna say this and then uh, I'll look to Barbara. Barbara says they do not. Okay, so we would assume that those numbers are actually lower in the long run because we would have students who choose Running Start and knowing that in Sammamish they now have access to um, another additional high school option. Central right. I think is running it. And uh, so along the same lines, the 400-100 isn't that we're forcing 400 but rather that it's gonna be placed nearer to East Lake and therefore we expect proximity to drive attendance? One of the things we've talked about is uh, potential need for a shift in strategy when it comes to uh, choice school and how we do lottery. So, uh, you know, we're, we're estimating at this point. In the past, we've been able to rely on um, hope. <laughs> you know, when we uh, built Tesla STEM, we made some assumptions and hoped that it would draw appropriately from the surrounding schools to enable capacity. As we move forward and grow and have more choice options, distributed throughout the district. We've talked about potentially the need to um, be more prescriptive in terms of how many spots are available um, you know, per, per school. So uh, in this potential you know, scenario, we're, we're making that prescription. That hasn't been determined yet that we're gonna need to do that. You, you, know, you brought up the running start variable that um, you know, so once we actually get closer to opening that school in 2022, we'd be able to um, determine whether we can be um, more prescriptive. We have some past practice around that when we opened Cambridge at Juanita High School. Um, the first year or two years, I'd have to go back and verify, that program was only open to students in the Juanita Learning Community, and then eventually when it grew big enough, we opened it to um, district-wide. So anyway, as, as John raised, the choice strategy um, that we have in place allows for two things. It allows us to provide a continuum of program offerings for students and families across the district, and it allows us to 
efficiently address uh, space needs. For example, as you all know, uh, we discussed in, you know, back in 2010 and made a determination that it would be a more um, efficient and fiscally sound decision to move forward with a choice school strategy at high school versus building a fifth comprehensive high school with all the amenities of a comprehensive high school that requires 40 buildable acres inside the urban growth area and all of those things. So um, as we continue to build out choice schools as, you know, as needed, we can um, determine the um, specifics around lottery processes to ensure that we're drawing the capacity appropriately from the right schools. And yeah, so the, the processes are not nailed down, but the physical location for the school is no secret, is it? it that's correct. So we own property in Sammamish, and uh, just like when this, uh, when a choice high school was um, back part of a plan in our 2014 bond that unfortunately didn't pass, um, it, we have the property in Sammamish. The plan is to build the school in Sammamish. And this is the property next to? It's essentially between Eastlake High School and uh, Eastside Catholic. Okay. So uh, we are in the process of getting uh, all of the project information for the 2018 bond projects uh, on the district website. So when, they're, when the location of the school is known, we will put the address there and um, put all of the kind of conceptual renderings and number of students served and so forth. All of that's in the works and will be uh, done soon and available on the district website. Okay. Speaking as a dad who got a kid to that bus for four years for STEM at 6.30 in the morning, I think your assumption that you won't get many from the west side of the district is probably reasonably good. Well, we review our draw data uh, <laughs> annually to see where kids are coming from as well. So uh, a recommendation uh, around high school is to shift students from East Lake High School to uh, Redmond High School. And that, are, that is, uh, it's the areas uh, on Union Hill, uh, currently a Dickinson area, and currently an Alcott area that are also are being proposed in our recommendation to shift to Redmond Ridge East Elementary and also proposed to shift to Redmond Ridge Middle School. They're also being proposed to shift to Redmond High School in this, in this recommendation. What this recommendation does, it redistributes some enrollment from Eastlake to Redmond High School. It does maintain neighborhoods in alignment with elementary and middle school boundary changes. It also takes into account both that short-term and long-term facility plan, knowing that we have a choice high school on the 2018 bond measure. We also have shorter-term needs for Eastlake uh, through a short-term plan, which is currently in development. So reviewing our criteria, we do believe that we maintained uh, neighborhoods to the greatest extent possible. This doesn't affect any current students. It only affects future high school students. It balances enrollment by 2022 with that planned opening of the new choice high school. Uh, it does not increase transportation impacts. We did consider both natural and man-made boundaries and in this recommendation, there are no program implications. Any questions about the recommendation before I go into other information? Just, I mean, I know that we had several questions that came out of the work session that we'll be getting that information on as well. And yes. so there was quite a bit around that. Yeah, and I, I following up on that, um, given that there won't be another uh, study session or another meeting uh, between now and when we decide on this, uh, I think it would be, and there was a lot of people in the crowd who had similar questions to what the board asked. Uh, and if the board's going to be considering that information, I think it'd be helpful if your responses were in some way disseminated to the public in advance of our board meeting. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but are, is that something you're able to do, and how would you do that? Yeah, uh, we update the Boundary webpage with information so that it's publicly available. Um, anytime we update the Boundary webpage, we push email to 
all families at Redmond Area Schools. So every school on the list receives uh, an email update with that information. Um, we also have community members and families that have sub subscribed to the Boundary webpage. We also make sure that they receive uh, communication as well anytime we update that webpage. So, so my suggestion would be that um, on that webpage we update um, information that the study session was held with the board this evening, that uh, these were the questions raised by board members, and then here are the answers provided to the board, which we will do um, soon. And then we'll, we can put all of that on the, on the Boundary webpage and notify people that that's there. And here's the link to, you know, the 30 minutes we spent on this piece of it would also be good. I would also add from the public comment the questions that came out of there as they spoke to have that as part of that list as well for ones that weren't covered prior. So actually go ahead and finish. You're on our last two or three slides, yes? Do it. We're about uh, 10 more minimum. Do it quick. So uh, in the timeline, uh, Overall, what this says is implement, elementary boundaries will be implemented uh, in the 2018-19 school year. Middle school boundaries will be implemented for the 2019-2020 school year. And the high school boundary change will go into effect for the 2019-2020 school year, but only for incoming freshmen that year. So any student who's attending high school in the 2018-19 school year will, can, will finish their high school at their current high school. Part of slow our, it down, this is important. <laughs> to go fast, to go slow. Part of our recommendation is always uh, reviewing the data around grandfathering. Uh, what is grandfathering? Uh, grandfathered students are given the option to remain at their current school for a set period of time. And so uh, with our final re recommendation, we run the numbers, we look at uh, opportunity, are we able to? Um, we always enter the process knowing that if we're able to provide grandfathering as an option, we will. And so um, we have a recommendation for elementary and middle school and high school. And so for elementary, um, our recommendation is to offer grandfathering for current fourth grade students uh, attending their neighborhood school uh, who will be entering the fifth grade in the 2018-2019 school year. It's important to note that grandfathering does not apply to students that are in a district program such as Quest. Part of our recommendation is also that siblings of grandfathered students would be able to concurrently attend the same elementary school for the 2018-2019 school year only. We also wanna make sure that uh, siblings of grandfathered students entering kindergarten, so those are students that aren't currently in our system, uh, but if they're entering kindergarten, uh, next school year that they would also be able to concurrently attend the same elementary for the 2018-2019 school year only. But after the 2018-19 school year, all grandfathered students and siblings would attend their assigned neighborhood school. Part of our recommendation is also that uh, transportation would not be offered or provided to grandfathered students or their siblings. Uh, that is due to uh, the impact and stress on the system and just we don't feel like at this point we would be able to um, fulfill that transportation obligation if it was offered. And so this recommendation comes without transportation. For middle school, we're also recommending uh, grandfathering. This is a little more complex because it's, uh, we're talking about next year's seventh grade students. So current sixth graders uh, that they would uh, be offered to stay at their current neighborhood school for eighth grade. Uh, and that would be for the 2019-2020 school year. Again, grandfathering does not apply to programs such as Quest. Siblings of grandfathered students uh, will be able to concurrently attend the same middle school in the 2019-2020 school year. 
in similar to our elementary recommendation that after that 2019-2020 school year, all gra grandfathered students would attend uh, their assigned neighborhood school. Again, transportation uh, is not uh, part of our recommendation for grandfathered students or their siblings. And since no current uh, high school students are affected, uh, there's no uh, grandfathering will not be available uh, to high school students. Since you're an audience who need to understand this, yes. So technically, the, hey John, the, the, the question. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. The, the question is, if I have a student who's currently in high school, are they going to have to change high schools? And the answer is no. Any student that is attending high school in the 18-19 school year will be able to continue in that high school until they graduate. So there won't be, we won't be changing students' uh, high school experience. I, I, actually, uh, hold on to that. Uh, what I'm thinking we're going to do is uh, we've actually got, at this point, we are about 45 minutes behind schedule on a meeting that was supposed to end at 945. Um, I'm really excited about this premise. So uh, if you have specific questions, um, I think the program report is not John, or is it John? What I would... If I would r yeah. uh, recommend that um, people write their questions down and give them to us, and so that when we update the web page or we can address the questions um, like we had discussed, that would be the most yeah. effective way to do it. And we, we've got a couple more items on the agenda, some of which involve John, some of which do not. It is possible that he could hobnob with you quickly if you have clarification questions at that point. So anyway, keep rolling, buddy. Okay. So the other issue that we con considered as part of our recommendation is variance. And a variance is where a uh, Lake Washington family requests to attend a school that's not their neighborhood school. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that we're uh, thinking about this as well. And so our elementary school variance uh, considerations uh, we know that all elementary schools in the Redmond area will be closed to variance in the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, we do that at, after a boundary change. Um, we make sure all of our schools are closed uh, so that we can actually implement the boundaries, know the impact of the boundaries, um, and build our projections from there. Um, ex exceptions may be granted. Uh, to our variance policy. Uh, we have a director of school support who is in charge of variances, um, and under these following conditions, uh, a variance may be granted. That uh, student that was in kindergarten during the 14-15 school year and changed schools for first grade due to the 14-15 Lake Washington boundary process uh, may be granted a variance if space is available. And to be explicit about that, if a student, a Lake Washington student was moved uh, just a few years ago uh, in elementary and because of this boundary process they're being moved again, we just want to make sure to call that out that uh, exceptions may be granted if space is available, but we also need to note that transportation is not provided for students receiving a variance. And so that's just to take into consideration um, those students. We know that students, um, that were in kindergarten that year will be entering fourth grade this upcoming year. And we know that uh, first grade students that year are current fourth graders and so they would be offered grandfathering. That's why they're not identified here. Um, for middle school, uh, essentially uh, same. The 1920 school year, uh, the Redmond area schools will be closed to variance and that we will follow our typical variance policy uh, where uh, uh, someone may request a variance to a closed school and that the director school support would evaluate that uh, and make a determination. And those really are exceptional exceptions uh, in this case. And again, if there is an exception made that transportation would not be provided. 
in high school, uh, for the last uh, number of years, we've identified our high schools as open to limited variances, and we've gone through a process each year to accept variances, and we've had to, at times, lottery, and we look at uh, kind of different tiers of um, priority. And I just wanted to call out here, um, possibly for this uh, issue that was just identified tonight, uh, when we're looking at variance requests between high school, uh, our policy states that first priority is given to students with a concurrently enrolled sibling at the requested school. And so it kind of goes back to that whole idea of a family being able to have students at a school. Uh, and so um, in this case, uh, concurrently enrolled at high school, uh, we wanted to call that out as part of this recommendation, also knowing that transportation is not part of the variance recommendation. Thinking about next steps, communication and transition planning. Uh, we know that after uh, the formal action by the board on November 21st, uh, we'll have a district level communication. Uh, it'll be sent out to all Redmond area families, uh, notifying them that the boundary decision has been made. And on November 28th, uh, we'll have our building uh, principals follow up with communication to their current families. So these aren't, uh, families that are uh, um, coming into their school next year, but these are their current families. And uh, Barbara and her team then work through and develop the communication plan for eligible families re regarding grandfathering because that's a whole process of notifying families and uh, receiving information about do they want to accept the grandfathering or do they wanna transition to their new neighborhood school. And then all throughout the spring, it's that's really that time where we're, um, our schools are working with our students and families. Um, some of that work is to say goodbye. Much of that work is to say hello. Um, the last uh, district-wide boundary that we had, um, we made sure that any student that was uh, going to a new school, that that principal went to the school. We also um, provided an opportunity for those students to go uh, to their new school, have it an event or an experience uh, so that it wasn't just brand new the first day of school. And so those are the types of things that that last bullet um, identifies. And that is the complete boundary recommendation. Thank you, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one clarification question, further modification of the proposal remains possible if a suggested edit yielded a better fit to the criteria than the existing proposal. But given the literally hundreds of hours that the team has already spent on this, such a modification is not particularly likely. Would that be a fair statement? So if requested, the Boundary Committee would get back together. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think another, just another thing to highlight, um, there isn't a suggestion that we've heard that we didn't evaluate. And okay. one of the things that is the most challenging to, uh, to rationalize is how can a small number of students create an imbalance in capacity? Um, and those are the things that we toil with. There's times where we can move a large number of students and just given how those students, because when we're, when we're developing our data, we're actually looking at numbers of the kids that are in the system. It isn't just arbitrary numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we move those kids you know, ahead to the next grade level, Sometimes they fit in magical ways, and other times uh, we're just really close to generating another classroom. And so, you know, three or four kids in a grade level can cause a school to increase the need for a classroom. And so, those are the those are the times where we're you know pulling our hair out because uh, there are decisions yeah. that have to be made in regards to the data that don't always make logical sense. And so, but. Uh, um, if needed. Uh, well, no, I actually, I, I, I would argue that everything that I've seen out of the committee does make logical sense. The problem is that it's considering seven things simultaneously, as opposed to on one variable where you might look at it and say, that doesn't make sense. 
um, and having dealt with headaches of this nature from the micro to the macro, this is definitely a whack-a-mole problem where if you knock it down one place, something else happens elsewhere. Part of this that's extraordinary is that we have two new elementary schools, and yet we had to change boundaries on every one of the existing elementary schools to make this puzzle fit. Um, I, I know how hard this is, and for you out there who are looking at it as this is tricky, it's trickier than any problem I've ever seen. Um, it is something that hopefully we've gotten to a point where, I don't know, it's, it, it's minimizing discomfort. And at the same time, I mean, I will say, last time we, did, did we have the additional Quest Middle School in there in the last cycle? I, and there are some new innovations that are actually the new choice piece. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we didn't have the second choice and, school until the last study session with. And the board. that comes down to I, I really want our audience to not only believe that we've tried to fit all the pieces, but tried to come up with as many creative solutions that actually weren't on the table up front as possible to get there. It is not impossible, but hopefully we'll be able to show to to provide you with 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 the rationale for things where in one dimension it seems to make all the sense in the world. Um, we have reduced the longest bus times according to our projections. Those weren't in the presentation. They will be part of the material that's provided. Um, and it, it does matter. I mean, I have to admit, time on the bus is not real effective homework. But it's also kind of unavoidable given how broad our district is. So anyway, any other questions for John? Siri? Um, mine's just following up. I guess my expectation would be based on the questions that have been asked in the request for a little additional information around transportation time, sort of some of those breakouts. As that information comes to light, how will that get incorporated and viewed into possible shifts or changes that could be? That would be my only piece, is that as we answer those questions, that we do take that time to reanalyze that and look mm -hmm. at that, and that you consider those things as a final in that process. So my answer to that is yes. So the board has uh, raised some, during study session, raised some questions that are not unlike some of the questions that were raised during public comment, requested some additional data. We will uh, follow up and provide that, provide it also on the, um, the Boundary webpage so then the public can know if they didn't attend the study session, they'll know what sort of questions and data that the board requested. As we're doing that, if something emerges uh, from that uh, that lends itself to a possibility that we hadn't seen before, hadn't considered before, absolutely that would be considered. On, I also don't want to sort of convey that there's going to be some magical solution that we hadn't seen before. And that, um, you know, as was discussed before, the committee really did uh, listen and l look at everyone's feedback and ultimately the recommendation by nature won't be able to, um, you know, meet with everybody's preferred direction and, and, and we realize that. So yes, we'll look at that and it, it likely will be um, that we can provide that additional data and the rationale and their likely will not be a change to the recommendation. Uh, however, there could be. And so I'm, I'm trying to convey that yes, we're gonna look at that data if something does emerge. And I also just don't want to um, convey that, that like, there's likely some solution that we haven't seen. It's not impossible. John, um, do you wanna say it any differently or, <laughs> or add anything? Okay. <laughs> You know, I, 
many of the questions that were asked tonight were uh, um, questions that we asked as a committee along the way, and so you know much of the much of the data will be you know providing you know what the committee discussed. Um, transportation times, uh, you know, that's why we had Jeff Miles in the room, because anytime we were looking at a neighborhood, we would ask him, you know, what's the transportation impact, and he would describe it um, from what he knew, anecdotally, you know, changes, you know, what buses would he send to an area based, and so uh, much of the information you requested were the things that we were talk we talked about throughout the process, and so, um, but again, like hopefully you've seen through this process, it's a reflective process for the committee. Uh, we look at we look at information, and um, I can say we we have heard your feedback. We've heard the community's feedback, and we knew it was a very challenging task. And I think as a committee, we feel good about where we've landed, and we're happy to answer these questions and continue to reflect. So um, there is one piece of silver lining I wanted to give the audience, and that is, speaking as someone who has a fair number of friends who are military brats, kids are more flexible than parents. Your children will survive the reboundary process, even if you do not. Um, it, 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 it happens. Um, that said, um, I also wanted to give you a lighter version of my previous tirade. Don't let the reboundary influence your vote on the bond. If you're unhappy with the reboundary, if I run in two years, vote against me. That's sending a message to the administration. Voting against the bond is hurting children. Thank you. All right. If I can just say one last thing is thank you first to the boundary committee yes. um, and staff. I do feel there has been a lot of work and when you speak of that iterations of things, if we go back to the first scenarios, that went out, these are decidedly different. Having been through multiple reboundary situations, each time we have definitely improved in how we engage with the community and feed back and forth. And I think that says a lot in being able to. I'm also appreciative um, that we have been able to address some of our long-term goals, especially in the sense we have spoken about trying to really neighbor, but quest into our neighborhood schools more effectively, of being able to expand choice programs. We've sort of taken a situation and been able to build towards our vision at the same time. And I think that's a very beneficial step and willingness to take that. That actually came up sort of at the end. So that I do say, so I do appreciate, which is part of where that expectation comes from. If something new does come to light, that we pay attention to it. Okay, Eric Kenny. Okay, uh, that takes us on to our second item on the non-consent agenda, which is policy on math, or the monitoring report. Okay, so we have our... Uh, so now we have a brief time that John... John, are you ready for questions in the hallway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he will be. So, all right. Okay, so we have... Uh, uh, end result monitoring report this evening for mathematics. So uh, Mike is going to uh, take the lead on this. I'll get us and again, I just want to say that uh, our uh, revision process this year and the improvements we've made to the end result uh, monitoring process is um, very helpful uh, for us. I, uh, I had shared with Siri that um, following the literacy report, Last time, um, the team, we've really taken back the feedback um, from the board, and that's led to us looking at the data in some uh, different ways and um, kind of engaging with our internal team in different ways to really determine uh, what we want to do to uh, take action based on uh, the priorities specified by the board. So um, we're excited to be here now to do the same process and the same cycle with mathematics. Uh, this really is an opportunity for us to better connect our ends and means. Our ends are the results that we want for our students tonight, specifically about mathematics, as well as um, our means, uh, specifically as it uh, connects to our academic program. 
So uh, this slide just spells out a little bit more detail what the uh, policy language is around the math end results. And um, there's also some ER3 or end result three in this because students are obviously learning academic thinking skills and strategies in content areas as well, even though we're gonna do a separate ER3 report. Um, there are aspects of ER3 in all of our um, content reports as well. And then, as I mentioned, the connection to the academic program. So uh, tonight, uh, last time Matt presented uh, along with me on the literacy report. This time Mike is presenting, and so uh, in the future you'll see John as well. So I, uh, we, we thought that was important because it's important for us to convey <laughs> and symbolize that these efforts are all of our efforts. So um, I uh, have a hand in this work, as does Mike, as does Matt, as does John, and then Tim Krieger has really been um, the data genius um, behind our data displays and um, the um, Power BI displays that the board has in addition to what you're seeing in the report tonight. So with that, um, I'll let you take the lead, Mike. We've gone through the report numerous times, and if there's anything that I want to chime in, I will. <laughs> uh, so thanks for the opportunity to share some of the good work that's happening in our schools, um, particularly in the area of math, and also um, our efforts to um, continue to improve our performance. Um, underlying all of those efforts is a math program that we have in elementary, middle, and high school. It's really a testament to our teachers and building administrators and central office folks um, who work to make sure that every one of the kids in our system has access to a really high quality core curriculum and instruction that's aligned to standards. And so I wanna just give you a brief overview of that math program. Um, so in elementary school, um, all of our students have um, 360 to 420 minutes a week of math instruction, depending on age, that's supported by high quality curriculum materials and resources. Um, we recently, well, 2011, so not so recently, but relatively recently went through a math adoption, um, and we have um, curriculum in place now that's being used um, to support core instruction as well as um, intervention. Um, we adopted intervention materials with that that are being used for ELL and safety net and special education. Um, at the middle school, you may remember, we did do a recent adoption, 2016, and adopted new uh, middle school, six, seven, and eight math materials, uh, and those were, um, put in place last year. We had training that went with that last year and then additional training that's happening this year. Um, we also, as you may recall, adopted a wonderful supplemental program with that called Alex that's being used with our middle school students as well right now. Um, and we're also seeing, we'll talk about later, that Alex is showing some promise at elementary and high school. Um, so wonderful program happening in middle school and training that's going on right now there as well. And then at high school last year, um, a high school math adoption specifically for algebra one, two, and geometry, uh, that is being implemented starting this year. Again, having that core curriculum makes a huge difference for our students. Uh, and then we have supporting resources and training that goes with that. We also wanted to take a moment to um, just remind you of our math pathways. The big idea here is that regardless of where students enter the high school math pathway, they can take up to four years of uh, math in high school. That could be a student who um, takes the traditional six, seven, and eight um, middle school math and then goes into algebra, has um, up through math analysis or pre-calculus in 12th grade, or students who enter uh, an advanced um, pathway early, as early as seventh grade, can get all the way through um, two years of AP calculus in um, high school. So again, that's that core curriculum that we have that makes sure every kid in our system has access to um, good experiences that continue their math into college. So this all is um, the curriculum that underlies our performance in math, and we wanted to start with our assertions uh, that overall we're making uh, reasonable progress in math and that we do have exceptions, and we'll talk about those in detail. Um, in particular, we have achievement gaps for some of our groups of students in our schools, and we're still working towards that 90% um, target in mathematics. So starting with our assertions and the um, performance of our students, if you look um, across um, the state for stu um, districts, the 49th largest districts in Washington, we're in the top tier um, of those districts for all of our students. And again, testament to um, the quality of instruction that's happening in our classroom and our teachers and principals and folks that support them. Um, so particularly for grades three through eight, um, first or second 
in the state for all students. Um, the math K, a little bit lower. Remember, that's a beginning of the year assessment. Um, so that's more of how students are entering the system. Uh, and remember that uh, we don't have the 11th grade because of the, if you may recall, there's a lower number of students that took the assessment um, last year. That's coming back up. So the assessment results didn't match up in terms of having that 11th grade data. Um, we are seeing some growth, um, not as much as we were seeing in ELA when Matt was presenting um, a few weeks ago, but there is um, some growth in grades three, five, eight, and then 11 with that, again, um, students that weren't taking the test are factored into that. And um, as we mentioned before, and similar to ELA, um, more students are earning full credit in math over time. So we're seeing about 97% of our ninth grade students are earning full credit in math. And again, that raised the question, okay, if we have really high results in math and we're still seeing some gaps, what's going on there? And that's something to explore. But at the same time, kids are getting the coursework they need and the credits they need to get to graduation, um, starting as early as ninth grade. So at this point, we want to talk about where we're seeing some exceptions. And similar um, to our English language arts presentation, we see exceptions for um, special education students, our students in special education, um, English language learners, students from low income households, and then some of our um, Latino American, our Latino Hispanic and black African American students. Uh, so overall, just big picture, um, we see gaps. And so what we'd like to do now is drill down into um, each of those areas. Um, in more detail, so special education to start. So as you saw when we were talking about all students, we were scoring in the top um, tier, one or two in each of those categories. Performance drops um, to some extent when we look at special education. Remember, however, that uh, this is just the top group of 49 districts, so um, we cut them off or we'd be running down below the screen. Um, we're still up in that top tier. We're um, ranking anywhere from sixth to 10th amongst the 49th largest districts in the state. Um, so we're performing in that top group. At the same time, there are districts that are outperforming us, and that's something that we want to be thinking about, what's happening in those districts. The other thing to note is that there are gaps um, that we're seeing in terms of the performance of our students receiving special education services and all of our students, um, and significant gaps that um, aren't closing in uh, most cases. And so this is an area that we need to attend to. Um, we talked at our last um, session about um, disaggregating because this includes all students with um, individual education programs, not just students with uh, math as an area, but all sorts of areas. There's 13 different qualifying categories for special education, and this includes um, all students who are eligible to take the assessment. Um, we also look at the cohort of students. Um, this is an older group because we don't have that elementary or that um, early assessment like we do for ELA. So we looked at our uh, class of 2021. Um, same thing here, somewhat flat performance, um, looking from sixth to eighth grade with that gap that we're seeing um, across, across time. So then the, this begs the question, well, what's, what are you doing? And one of the uh, pieces of feedback we received from our last uh, report was, Break this down to you know, things that you think are working, things that you are implementing that are new, because if you're getting the results that you're not happy with, you should be working on ad adding some new things. And then what are you evaluating? Uh, so our current approach is to make sure that we have goals in our um, uh, improvement plans at each school that really target groups of students. We also have, as I mentioned, curriculum that we've just put in place, uh, a particular uh, Supplemental curriculum, um, Alex, we're finding that is starting to see some benefits in elementary as well as high school, um, in addition to the middle school. We are um, also looking at professional learning. I think you remember when we did the program report for intervention services, the schools where we did really intense professional learning, we saw incredible results for. Um, we see that as a high leverage strategy. And so um, our safety net program is looking at providing really intensive instruction around uh, math. In, um, we're also looking at providing that training and support with our adoptions. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, we also are looking at that co-teaching model. So we're not pulling kids out of instruction to receive services, but there's a person in class, so they have access to that core curriculum. With special education, um, in terms of strategies, 
to review or looking at is something that you think is working really working. Um, we have a lot of supplemental curriculum out there that's being used in different ways. And so what we want to do is look at a number of factors there. We want to look at is the supplemental curriculum we have actually being used the way it's intended to be used? Is it still um, matched to the standards and the ways we know um, are effective to teach mathematics? And if not, are there better approaches out there? And so we are looking at that supplemental curriculum you see over there and doing an analysis and an evaluation of that to see if it's working. And if it's not, the idea would be to have either new supplements or replacement curriculum coming in. The other thing we're seeing an opportunity to do is to identify assessments that really home in on um, kids that need support, identifying them early, not just having those SBA results come in you know, at the end of the year and then using those, but screening students early and then having ways to check their progress more consistently. And so um, we think if we have that, then we can start matching the supplements and the um, interventions to them more effectively. So that's, that's going to be our approach for special education. For English language learners, uh, Mike, this is yes. before you move yeah. on. Uh, any it looks like questions or comments about mm -hmm. special education. Uh, you mentioned inclusion uh, service mm -hmm. delivery model. Mm -hmm. I I was under the impression you only had one or two programs that are up and being experimented with, or do you have more online or more coming? For co-teaching specifically. For co-teaching, oh, oh, yes, sorry. yes. So um, we just recently finished a. Um, kind of a survey of what's happening in our schools, and there are co-teaching, there is co-teaching happening Where? in some of our schools. I mean, how many, that's what I'm asking. Excuse how me? How many programs? Oh, um, <laughs> that was one or two. Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly the number. I, I'll have to, I'd have to pull yeah. it, but we do have, uh, Inglewood I know is, uh, we have co-teaching, East Lake High School we have co-teaching, uh, and that's specifically in math and ELA. Uh, and so our next steps are to see how effectively, looking at data, is it working, um, to expand it and identify what are the best practices of co-teaching. Ultimately, our goal is to have a co-teaching model in every, um, every secondary school to start for math and ELA. So it's a goal that we're working towards. Why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, do a follow-up yeah, on, a, um, you know, right. specifically where it is and mm -hmm. kind of a little more flesh around the the plan moving because forward. Because there is a lot of research out there about co-teaching and the effectiveness of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, English language learners, uh, we're finding that, and I think I mentioned this with our, during our program report, um, our ELA, our English language learner students are doing quite well in relation to other districts. So in the top tier of the highest um, performing districts, you know, relative to other um, students or other programs that have ELL. So, um, first, second, or third, um, or fourth for grades three, five, and eight. Uh, again, not to say that there's not more work to do, but in relation to other districts, um, promising. Um, we also mentioned, and just as a reminder, many of our students, um, after receiving ELL services in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, exit and go into uh, mainstream classes and get additional support over time. And so we see a pretty significant drop in um, the number of students. And the students who are remaining um, consist of two groups of students. We have some students that come in that are new to our system. And then we have some students that uh, are new to our system that had a test the previous year and then some that just have never had an EL. Um, proficiency assessment. So there are students that continue, and we'll show you um, some cohort data on that, but this is a group of students that have probably greater needs. They're, they're either not responding to instruction that we're providing, or they're coming into the system new and have never had EL services, or they're uh, maybe even new to the country in some cases, and so our approach has to take that into account. So we do see a decline in performance each year. We also have fewer students each year, and so we'll show you some data on that. Uh, just a reminder too, the students who we do have in the system that stay in our system that we have for periods of time, uh, as they go through our ELL program and have successive years out in uh, mainstream courses, do perform better over time. This is a really um, significant result. So students that are four years out from our ELL program are outperforming um, our all student group. And so that's, that's a success we don't want to lose. Um, and at the same time, we have significant gaps. So for example, you can see um, at each grade level, um, third, fifth, eighth, and to some extent, 11th, um, the students who are still in ELL at the time of the assessment are not performing anywhere near the all student group. And that would make sense for a number of mm -hmm. reasons. One is the assessments in another language. Um, the content, 
that they're receiving is also they're hearing that um, in English. And so there's that lag of um, what they're learning and the language that they're being taught in, as well as the assessment that they're being expected to perform on. Um, and just thinking about the vocabulary as an example, um, looking at the current SBA, I pulled up a, an eighth grade item. There were um, vocabulary terms like value and mapping and um, figure that had mathematic connotations. And if you just heard what a, of a map, you'd have that. And so there's that really complex interplay of language in math, just as well as there is in ELA, that um, is a barrier for students that we need to be thinking about as we're considering how do we address that. Uh, we also looked at how our students do. We took a cohort of students, for, again, for the class of 2021. And again, performance in this case is dropping. And as I mentioned before, it's also a smaller number of students over time. So um, that cohort started in sixth grade as 63 students. And about 30 of those students either exited the ELL program or moved to a different, um, a different school. And so uh, we are seeing, again, a group of students that persistently are having a harder time, and at the same time, that number is declining. So our approach, uh, and again, this is thinking about uh, what do we have in place that we know is working well, and what do we need to be thinking about to move forward and get better results? Uh, we do have very specific targeted goals, uh, and this, that shouldn't say special education, that's to say EL, ELL um, for school improvement, um, that are monitored by our directors. Uh, we have summer programs for students, and um, parent and family engagement. And then as I mentioned, the program that we're looking at is really targeted, um, it's a program called SIOP, training for teachers that really focuses in on that vocabulary. So as I was just mentioning, even in math, there's very complex math vocabulary that has multiple meanings. And so if we can start helping kids kind of break that or understand that language and decode that language, they can be more successful. Um, there's also work that's being done to not just work with ELL teachers, but uh, math teachers themselves to help them work with their ELL students so that when we have a student that comes in high school, for example, um, who's new to the country or who is um, still in ELL, that we're working on those needs to help them kind of bridge that gap between the content and what they're being assessed on so that they can be more successful. Um, and then longer term, there's there are programs. I think there's some promise in our dual language program that will develop over many years. So I think we were, were we taking little stops between each one or? I guess I have a question. The, the cohort data mm -hmm. is, is the most interesting in that piece um, in some regards. So are there thoughts of what you will do differently? I mean, the thought is, if I'm understanding this correctly, those 33 students in eighth grade were also in ELL in sixth grade. Correct. Um, so there's a question around how long it's taking them in which to learn the language as a right. piece. So how well are we looking at what are those other barriers, what learning disabilities might be there? Right. How do you start to tease yeah. those had pieces that very out? Yeah, conversation today. Um, and mm -hmm. I did actually look at that. For this group, um, there it was a, the, the number wasn't even didn't register. Mm -hmm. So there weren't any special education students in this cohort group. That's not to say that special education isn't a factor uh, well, or a learning disability right. or some other factor. That's what my question is. How yeah. much do you, how do you start to tease out mm -hmm. that piece of yeah. for, for what reason yeah. is the language being so difficult right. to learn in some regards? Um, um, and how do you start to address that issue? Yeah. And you know, the other thing I, I was going to share at the end, uh, these are, we're talking about these as discrete categories, but there right. is so much overlap in okay. many cases. Um, in some cases, we have ELL students who are low income, or there are, might be cultural factors that are impacting their achievement. Um, some of the students that are um, in the other groups we talked about that come into high school, their first experience in education is in an American high school. They haven't ever been exposed to um, education at all. So there's all sorts of variables in that group that we need to tease into. So just to say that there's a PSYOP strategy that's going to cure all of these problems is probably not the best approach. We need to know each individual student and what their needs are. So uh, there will be PSYOP strategies. There are also intervention strategies that are coming into place. Um, there's we mentioned, um, you'll see with low income, there's resources and services that'll have to come into play as well. Um, and again, you're right, we can't think of this is just an ELL student. It's a student with a whole series of um, factors that kind of accept. Right. Well, that's that whole piece is the context in which yes. the learning is occurring is that piece to look right. at. And so that's the. Mm -hmm. oh, and what, there's, uh, sorry. Oh, I was uh, just going to say, and what's great about uh, 
the new data displays is it we're able to tease out the data and look at it in ways that we haven't before. And I mean, the first step is being able to identify and pose the question so we can, I, it's clear that there's, um, that all EL students are not the same. There are a number of the original 63 and sixth grade who have exited. So whatever we did, for those students, they learn the language, and not only did they learn the language, they're they performing in mathematics. Well, so and there's another group of those students who haven't learned the language, they're still in program, and their math performance is declining. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we need to do something different for these different groups of students and not approach all EL students as homogenous. Correct. Were all 63 of those kids starting ELL in sixth grade? So that's the other thing that's not uh, reflected here is yeah. this is just the, in sixth grade. That's we just how many there were. So, yeah. so some of them may have not been have been in, in our sports. system in fifth, right? right. This is the need length it, of time in ELL. Well, it's, it, there's, mm -hmm. there's 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 some really fun pieces. I, I I agree with Siri that this cohort data is fantastic. Go back one slide. There's another trend in the data that I think is really meaningful, and that is that the gap increases not within any one of these, but from the top left, grade three, they're really not doing too badly after. E even without, mm -hmm. and it's the complexity of the, the barrier to the subject that language poses. I don't even think we should bother testing a kid for grade 11 math if they're an ELL student. You're, at, you're setting them up to fail. It's not fair. But the exited kids, that's where did the system work. And, but I really like this idea. I, I mean, at first I was thinking, oh, well, I'm actually not all that worried. No, I am worried, but it's a different problem at different levels. Mm -hmm. At the elementary level, I'm not sure you need to improve a whole lot. You just need to make sure that you keep doing it well. At the higher levels, then there's it becomes a more complex problem. It can't necessarily be a three-year process. Um, so anyway, um, but I, I'm actually, I mean, I just love some of these things in terms of the performance of exited students. There's a lot of kids who have come into our system not speaking English. By the time that they're out of ELL, they're performing with their peers. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Mark. Yeah, I'm wondering, when they do exit, uh, are we doing any kind of qualitative uh, interviews to say mm -hmm. what worked, what didn't work, why, are, why do you think you've uh, succeeded, uh, what really was the hardest part for you? My thought is, you know, that the numbers, okay, the numbers are good in some areas, bad in some areas, but my point is, the only way you're going to find out what works is to talk to those kids. And just to uh, analyze the numbers year after year after year without figuring out what in the world are we doing right or what in the world are we doing wrong is basically just riding a stationary bicycle. I think that's an approach not only for students in ELL, but for but any for student. For all students. Yeah, I'm sorry. But yeah. In particular, what we're looking at here. Right. All right, so students from uh, low-income households, here's an area where we, um, we see we're not performing um, at quite the same tier of schools that we were for ELL. So when we were talking about this this morning, we were saying, you know, there's of those 49 districts that continue down below the, the lines that you see up there, if we took the top 25%, uh, and that would kind of be in the upper tier. And we see for low-income that we're not always in that group. And so, whereas, with ELL, you saw we were performing, you know, first or second. Here we're um, looking at anywhere 11th to 29th, uh, and so that gives us pause or makes us wonder, okay, what's happening here? Um, so we want to unpack that a little bit more as well. We still are seeing gaps, um, and at the same time, um, there's some growth happening too. So, yeah. Sorry, I, I, this this is I love this kind of data, and I'm kind of fascinated that our regular competitors yeah. yep. aren't above us either. Right. We're all suffering. Yes. We're not doing a great job relative to districts that have significantly higher yeah. low-income populations. Yeah. Well, maybe we need to talk to each other. That's important. Maybe we need cool. to talk to each other. Yeah, that too. And, and really well, sit down and analyze what in the world are we doing right and what in the hell are we doing wrong. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's yeah. finish this and then we'll get to the question. And there, I, yes, I, we could spend some time talking about some different uh, hypotheses for that. Uh, we also see, as I mentioned, for our class of 2021 cohort, we are, um, we are seeing some improvement, uh, which is good, um, and a slight narrowing of the gap, uh, but it's still not where we'd want it to be. And again, if we go with the assumption that 
all of our students can succeed, we need to be thinking about what is it that's um, keeping these students from being able to demonstrate their success. So uh, again here, we're thinking about, um, we have lots of things in place through our safety net program. We, I think you saw at our title schools where we have our highest concentration of students from um, low income households, we're seeing good results. And so we think about how do we kind of take that and expand it across the system. So, uh, you know, our, our programs, our supplemental curriculum, safety net, good. And we think that there's probably a need to um, deliver effective um, practice instruction to our teachers across the system. Um, in particular, we want to get our safety net teachers up to speed, but then safety net teachers working with general ed teachers to be thinking about how do we reach kids who uh, maybe have different learning needs. Um, and so there's a whole series of things all the way from really high quality instruction to those supports that we know kids need. So getting to school, having a meal, someone that's keeping an eye on them. So um, in the past, we've had a McKinney Vento um, kind of contact liaison who was a portion of the day. We now have a full-time McKinney Vento uh, liaison who's working with students. Um, we'll also be uh, really thinking about how do we ensure that all of those needs that our kids need, have that are getting in the way of learning are being met so that they can have some success um, academically as well as socially. So any questions on that? Um, just real quick on the, yeah. have you looked at the low income? We look at it by district. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at it across our schools to see if there's a difference? So you're speaking oh, in terms of Title of I, yeah. um, my interest. Yeah, so that's one of the, um, when I mentioned that through this process, right. our next step then yeah. is to meet as a team and to dig into the school by school data and so we've yeah. just done that for literacy yeah. and we're putting some things in place and that's what we will do for math following this process as well. Yeah. So absolutely. Because similar to when saying that those districts were different yeah. above us, that's also an, an interesting piece to start thinking. Right now we're comparing to greater than 6,500. Yeah. If you look across all 295 districts in Washington State, um, there are s several districts that consistently will right. be above us. Um, they tend to be smaller. Yeah. But I think there's pieces to learn from that small environment too, and how do we and build on those? Tim Krieger did just pull, and he's working on it for math now. Um, a school by school, all schools by free and reduced and performance, oh. and it gives you this really nice trend line that you predict, and then you can see how schools relate um, above or below that trend line. So it can help you to see those outliers to start to identify. And we have some of our schools who are outliers, both positive and negative. So that'll exactly. be some really exciting work in the future. Um, so again, for, for race and ethnicity, we are finding that um, in grade three, for example, we're in that top tier. Uh, five, we're kind of on the edge, and in grade eight, we're in that top tier. So we're performing as well as the highest performing districts for this group of students. Now again, that's not the performance we want, but again, in relation to other districts, we're, um, we're performing well for our black African American. I, I want to stop. Well is relative to the other districts. I want to be really clear on that. Um, Latino, Hispanic uh, students, um, again, not quite as um, quite in that same tier, that same level, but um, still in that top echelon of districts around the state. So then we get to gaps, and again, these are areas where you just you ask yourself, what's happening here? Because uh, we have students, the color of your skin should not predict your performance on an assessment. So we are trying to drill down to what is going on, what's happening. Um, is it, and we have now the ability to look at, is it language, is it income, is it something else? Um, but we see persistent gaps for uh, Hispanic, uh, Latino, and black African American students. Uh, even over, um, over time, we see those gaps. So if we look at our class of 2021 cohort, we are seeing some improvement, but the gaps persist. And then we, as I mentioned, we can, um, we might have this hypothesis, well, what, maybe it's language. We have, for example, maybe some of our Hispanic Latino students, it's, they're still in that, um, still working on language. But even there, when we account for um, language or income, uh, we still see pretty significant gaps by racial group. So again, you would, you would think that, okay, students who have never been in an ELL program, Hispanic students that language is not and maybe a barrier for, they should be performing as well as any other student in our district, and they're not. Uh, so this is, again, where we are starting to think about what's in place, and we know we have good systems in place, we see good results from them, but we also know that we need to dig deeper. And so, as I mentioned, that idea of really 
um, looking at professional learning and high quality instruction for every kid, and then our district-wide equity efforts, I think, are gonna start to bear some fruit too, and really thinking about culturally competent instruction and curriculum, and that's everything from high quality curriculum and high quality teaching to relationships that teachers build with students, and it includes uh, making sure that the culture of students is reflected in the curriculum, and making sure that kids have opportunities to work together and start to get away from this competitive approach that, um, that we have in some of our classrooms. Lots of different ways we can change the way we deliver our instruction to meet the needs of our kids where they are and to improve outcomes. And so we'll be digging into that deeper as part of our equity work. Um, there's a real strong commitment on the part of our directors of school support, our central office folks, and our principals and our teachers um, clearly seeing that need and wanting to do something about it. Uh, and we're seeing some promising work ahead in that area. So uh, again, as a summary, we as a district are performing very well in relation to other districts around the state. And at the same time, we have groups of students who aren't. And so uh, we want to keep working on that just like we are for ELA. Uh, and we see some real promising opportunities that are coming. Uh, we didn't mention the dual language program that we're starting to work on that we'll be talking more about tonight. We see that as some opportunity. There's some other work that's happening in special education that we'll be sharing throughout the year. Uh, and we're seeing hope. Uh, hopefully optimistic, I should say, is the way we, sh we would end this, um, and more to come. Thanks, Mike. So as part of the um, process, we, wanted, we want to make sure that we're capturing, right, Diane's capturing sort of those verbatim uh, mm -hmm. questions um, that came up during the presentation, board comments, and then uh, you're the this time around, right? So all of those will then go to yeah. Chris. So broadly, I agree that we're doing reasonably well. And I will say that most of my comments are actually sort of structural pieces. On, uh, on the SPED front, I really want to figure out some way to split out specific learning disabilities so we can look at the performance of those programs. Um, and, and or um, I saw something on the uh, specifically designed instruction is just lumped in with everything else. Actually, I'd like to see what SDI does. Mm -hmm. That might be another useful subset to look at. Um, the, uh, Chris, can you just clarify that? What do you mean yeah. by that? Well, what sorry, is SDI? I, so right now, SPED means everything from dyslexic to Down syndrome. And I understand that the, the the breakout by yeah, yeah specific learning so breaking out by SLD. But what did you, what was I just wanted so to make sure specifically I'm designed this, instruction yeah, was specially designed instruction part that was on slide I want to say twenty five no uh, yeah okay slide eighteen so the the data reflects all students with IEPs when we're looking at the gap analysis um, whether or not they're receiving specially designed instruction in math while specially designed instruction is doing something, it would be nice to split them out from the kids who aren't receiving right. specially designed Thank instruction. Thank you. And I should say, just to touch on that, when we were talking about that curriculum, um, we are meeting with special education teachers who teach math in a resource room setting and going, is that working for you? And, and by and large, they're saying, you know, we're having some challenge around that. Yeah. So we're looking at that curriculum with that group, and that is that specially designed instruction. You're but, but wait, I just want to make sure that, yeah. can you go back to the slide yeah. that we were just on? So I think, Chris, what you're asking is, could we get, so this is showing any student who has an right, IEP, IEP in their math yeah. performance. Right. Right. This isn't showing right. students who have an IEP with math goals right. and are receiving spe specially yeah. designed instruction in mathematics. Correct. Right. So the, and again, I mean, these and are- And I don't know how easy it is to break that out, exactly. but I'd love but to see it. But that's the request. I think we that's can pull out the trying. specially designed instruction for math because many of those students, I mean, they have math in their minutes, but many right. of them are receiving services in a resource room setting. Right. And so easy one to say, okay, in our resource room math settings, yep. how are our students performing in relation to everybody yep. else? Because that really is targeted with curriculum. It's an right. area we know, is it making a difference? Yeah. Um, now we have other students that are served in a general ed setting that might have a math IEP. Right. And so that also would have, that'd be a little harder to dig out. But we have at the secondary level students, we could pull it by course, um, resource room math. Yeah. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. 
And, it's, and, it's one part, though. I, like, like well, as with everything, I mean, what I'm loving about these is you're, you're, you're giving me exactly what I want to see. I want to see the opportunity to ask the next question. And the next question that obviously leapt to mind for me on SPED was on those two ends. Uh, and SLD is one end of the spectrum. The other sort of end of the spectrum I'd be interested in is seeing it broken up by LRE 1, 2, and 3. Um, so, but that's the follow-up. It's the question that the data prompts from me. We do see the same sort of progression of the gap. So if you look at this slide 18, we're seeing a gap that's about 40 points in third grade. By the time that you get to 11th grade, it's at least 50, probably closer to 60. The data is noisy. I mean, since we haven't got that many kids who took it in 11th grade. Um, but it's, uh, eyeballing it from third to eighth grade, yeah, that's a bigger gap. And so SPED kids are falling off the wagon in math, mm -hmm. finding how do we keep them in. It's important. Same thing that we're talking about with ELL. Interestingly, low income didn't show that trend at all. Low income has a consistent gap throughout all grade levels. And so they're either on the bus or they're not, mm -hmm. but they're not falling off the bus. I'd like to see it start from a higher baseline so that we, because that gap still troubles me, but it's not a growing gap as the kids proceed through our system. Correct. Um, the, uh, God, there's, there's so much, and I don't want to keep everybody here all night, so I'm just going to try and. But our whole goal is for the discussion of this. So I know, I exactly. So I highly recommend I'm keep you going. continue yeah. holding that conversation. Well, no, that's the whole thing. I, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to dive into the, the, the little details. I mean, there are some things where when you show me for, um, the gap between blacks and Hispanics and other races for the low income subset, I want to see that for the not low income subset too, because I'm guessing that that other one shows a difference, or rather that the gap closes a lot. Anyway. Yeah, I, rather than, I'll just, I just want to echo that. It's something I'd like to see in future yeah. presentations too. So uh, basically yeah. when you show something, just show the, the opposite group, the, the excluded group. Mm -hmm. So SLD versus not SLD or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, we could. I think it was on different slides, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So there's the students who are, well, you're right. But that's it's all students, students versus. It doesn't include, yes, non-low yeah. income. And we can yeah. pull that. It's very easy to pull. Yeah. 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 So and, and it was basically when I was looking at slide 38 was where the next slide. Right. That race, ethnicity, low income, I'd just like to see next yep. to it, race, ethnicity, not low income. Not low income, right. Um, let's see. Uh, Siri, you got any, Eric, any specific stuff to chime in on while I find my next comment? Because I know I've got more. Siri, go ahead. Go ahead and write it and add to the rest. Go for it. Oh, oh. yep. Great, yeah, Chris, do you have any more you can finish up? Um, well, I, I definitely, when we were talking about the low income analysis, I think Siri's notion of comparing our Title I schools to not Title I schools, it's, I don't think it'll be big enough numbers to compare individual buildings, but Title I versus not Title I, the performance of low-income students in those two settings would be really useful. Um, I, I really hope that it shows that Title I's, that those kids are getting a big boost, and how do we then extrapolate that? Um, the, yeah, breaking out SLD, I, Apparently had a lot of capitals on that. Um, that captures most of it. I mean, it's it's something where the the trends that we're seeing in math. I would like to see the overall trend going upward. That's the one trend I'm missing. It's we're 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 achieving, but we're not improving. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I guess that's one's reach should exceed one's grasp. That's a piece. It's, I'm not so much worried about any specific gap, but on that one as a whole, how are we, what are we working on to improve? So, okay. Mark? We keep talking about how we want to improve to this percent or that percent, and, I'm not, and you're, you go back and you're trying to compare your numbers, you're comparing to other districts. Are we doing any kind of research to see what programs, innovative programs, are out there beyond our neighbors hmm. to, uh, to look at what's working in Florida, what's working in New York, whatever's, you know, to find out some innovative programs that might, our neighbors might not be looking at, and maybe that would be the spark that really would light some of these kids to, to jump. Um, and whether it's in the math or whether it's, for that matter, on uh, language arts, uh, it's the same thing. I mean, fact that we're not looking beyond our neighborhood mm -hmm. 
bothers me. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because I was raised right beyond our neighborhood. So um, I, I do want to just chime in on that one. I know that this is the process where we're just uh, collecting board comments and questions. But I do want to say that um, we do do a couple of things, because I just don't want the lingering impression no, to no. be that we're exactly. not looking at um, other districts across the country. So uh, we, we, for example, Mike just came back from a, a conference. So one of the things we do is we send people to conferences um, which is about learning best practice from other districts. So this one was specifically on dual language and um, achievement of students as part of our research around dual language. So I don't want to get into all the details of that, but um, that's you know learning about how other districts have implemented dual language and what results they have received from that. So one thing we do is attend conferences. We're a member of Western States Benchmarking Consortium, and that's um, seven other districts um, from Western states that we meet with uh, two times a year um, to learn from what they're doing because they are um, similar demographic high-performing districts. Uh, that's just two things I want to mention. So we can follow up and kind of a, 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 um, unpack that a little bit more and give some more examples, but I do just want to assure you um, that uh, we do do that, and Hanover Research is another right. um, method we use to do a scan through Hanover of what's happening in other districts, mm -hmm. what results they're seeing, and how can we learn from those. Well, that's what my point is. If, yeah. if in these presentations, uh, whether it's the math, whether it's the, uh, it's the language arts, whatever, um, I would like to hear, you know, what other programs you've looked at, something that's caught your eye, something that you think might be worthy of, this, of the district uh, experimenting with, or at least investigating, uh, because it does because if we are having these efforts, let's not hide our candle under a bushel basket. Let's say, okay, we're trying to find what works, and we're looking at things. And then, you know, come back and say, look, we looked at it, and just, mm, it's not really working as well as they thought that was. Yeah. You see the, going? the other thing I'd add to what Tracy said, we are, we partner with larger organizations mm -hmm. um, to have them give us consultation and oftentimes connect us with some. So two um, in particular, we're working with the University of Oregon right now on the idea of tiered systems of support. We're also, we have a conference call set up with SWIFT on Wednesday who consults nationally um, with districts to look at effective practices from around the, the country. And so it's not necessarily this district is doing this, it's as they look across the whole system, they say here's what we're seeing as effective practices. And that happens in many of our programs. Um, partnering with universities or national organizations that have some. some I think parents would like to know that, right? Oh, sorry, I'm not ahead on. I think parents would like to know that, the fact that uh, we are looking at other programs. It, we, we care beyond the numbers, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. And if we're just looking at our numbers and are looking at our performance numbers, that we moved from 85 to 86 this year, uh, well, great, but what are we doing to make it move to 90? And what are, we, what are programs that are out there that we might want to consider and kind of open up for uh, what we're doing to, to better our program. So Mark, Hang on one sec. Yeah. Part of the ends results in the monitoring process is the retrospective and looking back over that time frame and to come up with what those focus areas and priorities might be based on what we're seeing here. So I think what you're speaking to is are there specific focus areas based on what you've seen in the data that you think additional deep dive, digging into, looking into opportunities might be the way to go. So that's what I would pose to you is, in looking at this, what would be your focus areas that you would think would be an area to do so? Well, I, to be quite frank, if we're looking at uh, the race gaps, we're looking at the low income gaps, we're looking at the special education, each one of those categories, we should be looking at what programs are out there? So actually, this is something where, uh, Mark, I totally agree with you that we should. The thing is, I'm not sure that's part of the ends results discussion. I think that's a work maybe session in be. math. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, maybe it should be, to be quite well, frank, rather than yeah. just looking at the damn numbers. I'll what I'd like to say is, I look <laughs> at this, and it's clear to me that our pre-K numbers, when they come in, they start, our gap starts there, mm -hmm. and continues. Yep. So. If I look, it's in ELL, it's in special education, it's in Latino, it's in low income, it's in black African American. You see it actually get a little bit worse in third grade based on that. So there, there's a piece I keep thinking of. 
I'm looking actually not at the comparative, yeah. but actually looking at the results. Um, and actually, if I look at ranking, low income for pre-kid was ranked 29 out of those 49 right. districts. I, would, I just want to add to that briefly. We were talking about this today as well, um, that that assessment is an observational assessment conducted by teachers at the beginning of the year. So it's really not a reflection of what's happening. And I hear what you're saying, they're coming in. Absolutely. But the skills, the skills on that assessment are just worlds apart from what you see in a third grade SBA. So yes, there's a, there's a gap, but it's, a, it's kind of an apples to oranges comparison, if that makes sense. Actually though, what, what my argument would be is not that I'm comparing it to it. It's clear to me that it's, and I understand it's, object, it's subjective, right. and there's those components. They're working yeah. with Innerator. The reality is, is you saw this in ELA as well, um, and we know this. You know, research has shown, right? Solid preschool, solid mm -hmm. pre-K learning helps to set up the path going forward. This is becoming clear in looking at this wall, kids, that that's a piece that, and that's not directly, we as a district don't do a lot of that work. I mean, we serve some students, special education, we do some head start, but we don't have a large population. And the other piece that's never considered with pre-K, head start is to 100% federal poverty level. Our low income is to 185% of federal poverty level. So there is a percentage of students that don't truly necessarily have economic access in some regards. So this is something that there is a lot of collective impact models around this and actually working from a broader perspective and whereas it's not the district's role necessarily at this point, I definitely think it's something we should be thinking about um, and not just in math. You saw it in and I think would see it across the board. So I guess that would be my one piece of something just to think about from what the data is telling me that I see that and it'd be ideal if we can get them. And so my next question is, do our programs that we currently offer in preschool, do they have the kids be kindergarten and ready when they come in? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question, the full question. Did, did they have the kids? Are they kindergarten ready on WA oh. kids? How I mean, do they it's perform? It's the same right. question that came up on, yeah. on, exactly. on literacy. Right. So right. are we being ineffective? And if so, then is there something we can do to help support preschool programs elsewhere? So mm -hmm. I think that's one of those pieces. Mm -hmm. um, from a comparable concept, um, I, when I remember back to our March retreat, when we actually had s spoken about how we did this, the goal was to be in the top quartile. Right. Um, and I think as, as we've gone through this, there's some piece of, it's not that we are just comparing, it's that truly, so where should we be paying attention if we do it from a quartile mm -hmm. concept? And that's when I start mm -hmm. looking at, maybe that focus is low income yeah. to, a, to really some component of it. Um, trends, there, if our 95% is our goal, we've never put a year on that or sort of what the range time frame on that, but if we're only increasing by one or two percent, um, trending wise, we're not going to get there. Um, so I think those are the pieces that as I look at this that I still think about um, and focus on, then, so there is the piece I think this can help perform where do we focus and think about from where we go with it. Um, you know, if we only have 40% passing something, I think mm -hmm. there is some question of, okay, that number's gotta shift. That, that we just can't stay there. Um, and it needs to shift quick. We don't have five years to wait because those students don't have five years to wait. Um, so I guess that's where some of the things that this called out to me to think about um, in doing that. I think the equity work is important and very key in going forward. I think that played out in a lot of places. Um, and I think you spoke about even with EL in the sense of what is their context that they come to us? What's their family background that they come to us with? Um, and how do we support that? and value it and then use that for launching learning from that component. So I think all those pieces. So some of those wraparound services and those pieces, a lot that I see when I look through is curriculum based mm -hmm. and very in the day. I don't see a lot around um, how do we build a different type of support. Mm -hmm. You know, our PTAs do a lot of that work after schools. You know, how do we even strengthen that piece, even from a math side? Um, 
or holistically and how do we bring that in? So I guess when I look through those, those were the sorts of things that I sort of saw falling out um, mm -hmm. in the data. Eric? Chris, could I, yeah. would, would yeah, be, I just want to um, make a, a, a comment and reflect really quickly on a couple of things that, that were said. Uh, I actually think, Siri, some of your questions that you just posed are very similar to the questions that Mark was just posing. And I think there's a difference in, uh, in the conversation between if we're truly, if the board is truly staying in the, the governance um, role and um, there's a difference between saying uh, you know, I wonder if we're doing research on what's working in other places or what the PTA, you know, what the system is um, versus I think you should do X, Y, Z. So I think if, if either of you were saying, I think you should do X, Y, Z, that would be stepping out of the role of policy governance. Uh, whereas I don't think anything that you said, Mark, or anything that Siri just said is stepping outside of the role of policy governance. Because what I didn't hear, Mark didn't say, I, I know there's a district in Alabama or wherever oh, yeah. that is doing X, and I think you should do X. So Chris, you know, to, I think that wouldn't be part of yeah. policy governance end result versus I think the questions that you were posing about are we looking and seeing what's working in other places or are we considering systems and including PTSAs and so forth? I think those are open-ended questions that, um, live fine in this process. Well, yeah. It, so I just wanted to get that on the mm -hmm. table. I mean, just I think that that's, and you know, we're, it's then, you know, you, you're, we're gonna send you all of these questions and everything, and then Chris, you'll be able to say, board consensus is these are the areas that we want you to focus on, and these are some of the questions that came up. And I think that that's completely um, within the bounds of the process from my view. I think parents wanna know, not just the numbers. They want to know mm -hmm. what are we trying to do to move those numbers. Oh, I, I wasn't and trying to shut you down on that at all. I, I, I do agree with you. And what are we looking at and how do we think we can do it, you know, it without, you know, you want to think about those, the process, what programs are you going to put in place, what are, what are you considering, what do you think might work uh, in addition to just going from 94 to 95? Yeah, but your, your point is how do we keep a finger on the pulse of research, and then how do we bring the best of that in here and make it work? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, the the only piece of that broader conversation that I have not, I mean, I know best practice is how this system works, but I just really wish there were some way we could do pilot programs, test something out, because otherwise you wind up with a million initiatives and none of them ever die and no one ever knows what's working. Well, we do do that. Th that's, the po that's the point yeah, of having yeah. research. Yeah, that's the point. was great. Yeah, we'll yes, but to know when you give one of these, the pilot programs would be a really nice thing to see as far as, well, and what do you, what's your bar for this is working or not? Well, it's like the AVID program that we've added. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a pilot program, and we've seen how it's worked, and we've seen how well it's worked. And I'll lay you odds if we took the numbers, the kids, their, those kids' uh, scores and tracked them, we would have a new variable that we haven't really looked at. Mm -hmm. But my point is, if, if those programs are out there, rather than just looking at them, maybe we ought to be looking at some pilots as AVID or the others and do them mm -hmm. and stop lo just looking at our numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have, uh, I'm, I'm just going to jump in yes. now. No, no, you, you've been quiet. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, I, have, I wanted to make this comment because it was about this slide, and, and it was just... I think somebody referenced this earlier. The, this slide is interesting to me because the districts, there are very, they're different, uh, different districts that are above us than, or at a lower level than we often see. And I have, I mean, well, I, don't, I understand you, we may have some hypotheses for this, but what I think is interesting about it is that to me it suggests um, that we need, an, I guess an action item would be, we need to, uh, we should be look, we may want to be looking at, um, I, I guess unpacking what what about low and maybe this is help would help us unpack what it what it is about being low income uh, that affects performance um, and to me and to me that that is perhaps what is indicative in this data not necessarily what these districts are doing different but maybe the pop the low income population groups um, that they have um, and that in our school by school 
uh, data could help uh, unpack that as well. I, I'd just be really interested to see that. It's, this slide raises a lot of, it was interesting. Um, it just raises a lot of questions for me. Well, and I, I, just to add to that, I think you know there is a sense of what works, um, and I think there's a sense of scale here too. So a school that has the majority right. of their students that are low income has a school-wide effort and everybody's on board. A school right. that has seven to 10, 15 kids, that, to get that to scale across a whole school is it's just a different ball game. Um, but there are, I mean, we've had poverty in our system and we've been working on poverty for decades. And I think there, we, you're right, those schools probably have started to scale up and put into place practices that address very specific needs like vocabulary of students who come from homes that are impoverished, like um, having your basic needs met and having a secure, safe place. There's lots of factors, leading factors, that contribute to students' performance that we're aware of. And you're right, those schools are probably doing some really specific, concrete things that we could learn from. It's very helpful. There's actually an article in the Seattle Times, I believe, today, specific education lab that talks about low-income families and working yeah. and different things. Yeah. I can't remember which school district they highlighted. I'm blanking right now. Um, but I do think you're right that the, the numbers make it. The, the challenge we have is it's, it's a hidden component often. Um, and so if somebody's struggling in math, you know, if my daughter struggled in math, I, I could pay for a tutor if I had to. Um, but that's not a guarantee mm -hmm. for everybody. So I do think that's a component to it. So, so go ahead, Mark. Well, as you, and again, as you look at poverty, the idea of, of are they, why aren't they performing in math? Well, gee, maybe the higher income kids have parents at home that aren't working two jobs that can help them with homework or see that the homework gets done. Whereas the uh, parents who are working two or three jobs, uh, yeah. they can't. Yeah. They don't have the time because they're just not there or they're so bloody tired mm -hmm. that they just don't have the ability to, so. And, and so this is something I, I have to admit, I, I, I work in a public health department. And so when we're talking about all of the gaps, all of these are interesting challenges, but not, they aren't all equally important in terms of trying the number of kids who are affected. The two, it, it, so black and Hispanic, we talked about those as if they were equivalent challenges. I think, what is it, 15% of our population is Hispanic and 1.5% is black African American? I'm sorry, there's one of those populations that's a much bigger group where we can help more kids by solving the problem. So, and what I'm concerned about is that we've raised a large number of possibilities without giving you focus on arenas of interest. My personal arenas of interest are low income and Hispanic. Those two, oh, sorry, the third being SPED, but the SPED we've got to unpack before we can go much further. But those are the two I'm interested in really digging in further and starting to tackle. And that doesn't mean that any of these groups are mutually exclusive. When Sears talking about wraparound services, theoretically, that's universal. That's a cut curb effect. If you can come up with the right, the right model, it doesn't matter whether it's ELL, low income, whatever, that level of support works. But for now, in terms of the deep dives, I would focus on those two groups, which represent, uh, and actually are significantly overlapping groups within our group, within our population. So in looking at this and, and what we've seen, what would, in a year, what would you like to see changed in, what, in, from, in the data that's being presented? What would you like to have seen moved in a year? Frankly, I think that there are some numbers that are a whole lot easier to move than others. But, and we've come back to this several times as we've been going through this. In ELA, we came back to this as well. Moving the numbers early on, all of the trends are slowly declining. If we can move the baseline up in the early years, the K3 numbers, I don't actually care about what the numbers are when they arrive in kindergarten. I do care about where they are at third grade. At that point, it's sort of a, you're, you're gonna lose. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm just going to ask. I'm going to ask Mike. I think that at this point, you go ahead and sit down. <laughs> because what I see happening yeah, is discussion the discussions the being directed yeah. at Mike, where this is the opportunity for the right. board to discuss yeah. what you all think is the priority right. and then to deliver that back to me right. so we can move forward. So I just don't want, because it looks like you're, in, yeah. and Mike's doing this. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, and just, I just want to make sure that, like, I, this is, yeah, this right. is the great part about the right. new process. It's the board process to have the conversation about what do you all want we'll generally to try agree and do on 10, but is, the, is the, the focus. And so whether whether you want to keep the same process that we used last time, which is we took all the individual board comments, if you remember, this is what the board said <laughs> yeah. that you wanted to do. Tonight, yeah. you wanted to raise individually uh, comments and questions. We, um, Diane's been getting all of that verbatim. We turn it back around to you, and then there's the board process to discuss and share and determine mm -hmm. what do you want the priority focus to be that you're gonna deliver Actually, back to me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take minor step back from what I said I'd like to see. Third grade has already got a lot on their plate. Learning to read, reading to learn. That's a transition that matters hugely. Even I'm willing to grant that maybe ELA we should take priority at that point. Fifth grade, if you haven't got arithmetic, you're toast for the rest of your mathematical career. So I would actually be comfortable making fifth grade our benchmark target for the moment just to see if we can move the fifth grade numbers. And we've got room to move them. So does that seem reasonable? <laughs> I, I, sorry. I, I, yeah. <sighs> You look as tired as I feel. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure I've got a whole lot more useful discussion. I actually feel pretty good about, I, I, I do want to say this to Mike. I feel really good relative to previous years about how much you've surfaced out of this without guidance. And now it's like bringing up the stuff that we really want to dig into and find where have we got leverage? Where can we actually focus? And just to remind the board, so we're able to do this because of um, the, the board discussion at the last extended yeah. study session in March and what you laid out in terms of what you want. So now we're able to, as a team, go back and develop the ends result reports that reflect that and bring it back to you. So then you have the, that, those results and you can say now, Here's where we want you to focus. So, so I mean, you you asked about fifth grade. I would say yes, that seems to make sense. That's an endpoint through elementary um, that you could look at. The other piece, and we actually don't have this one there, but is often utilized is algebra. Um, but that's a different indicator. So I would make a suggestion for a new indicator that we deal with is actually how many kids have passed algebra by ninth grade, since that is the mm -hmm. graduation requirement, more so than the math credit. How many kids um, are talking pathway? to him, talk to me. No, no, no. How many kids are reached? This is something where your point, the slide that you had, three pathways, I'd like to know how many kids are in each pathway at each grade level. Okay, so just by term, in terms of process, you since, write that on that, feedback. since <laughs> if, if part of what the board wants to see is new right. key performance indicators, we defined the key performance indicators mm -hmm. on an annual basis and that drives the, then the reports oh, that we do. Oh, this isn't a KPI, this is really just to well, look at it and decide if it's a KPI. I've never looked at it. Then put it down yeah. as something that we add, and then in March we look at bringing that up and deciding if that's the next step yep. we want to I take. know I'm comfortable with that. Fair? Yep. No, no, that's fine. Well, that was, because the one piece, when I looked at the, did they pass math in ninth grade, that indicator, I mean, and that was true in ELA. We have 95%. It's not relating really specifically to, um, Success. We know algebra is a gateway um, math to many of our sciences to to access. It's a requirement for graduation, if I'm not mistaken. You have to pass algebra and geometry, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it would make more sense to me almost that we look at shifting what that indicator is. Not so much a math credit as it is that they've passed algebra in ninth grade. Um, so that would be one of the feedback pieces I would put on, as I think would be more useful. Yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of that. And I would agree that we have reasonable progress um, in the sense of overall, we do very well. It's the exceptions into those subgroups. And if I were to choose a subgroup to really focus low income, 
Um, and I think Latino, we have some work that's, I think there's a lot, you have the natural leaders. So it'd be interesting to see all of those, to start doing the evaluation piece on those things. Did we move the needle like we expected to? Um, and that's the piece, whereas it's not qualitative, it is saying, if we do this, we expect X to happen. Well, if X doesn't happen, then mm -hmm. you gotta figure out why, but give yourself the time frame in it, and that's the piece to me that sort of needs, the trend always concerns me when the trends are flat. Yeah, well, and that's the other piece. One year does not a trend make. And these and, were three. Yeah, exactly, and <laughs> that's something where, for me, if I was saying for grade five, you know, 73, 73, 76. We yeah. got a blip where we went up by three. That's flat enough. Um, I really, you know, in the next three years, if we can get two of the three above 80, I'll believe that we are doing better. It's not that I'm asking you to get to 95. I feel like that would just cause paralysis by setting you up for failure. But if we could say, look, we're really gonna focus on moving the needle on this, and how much does it need to move before we believe that that's a trend, not a blip? It's not something where if it went down by that much, we'd write it off as, oh, that's just this year. So, anyway. I'm about to turn into a pumpkin. I've slept poorly two nights in a row. i am really only got about 10 minutes worth of consciousness left in me. I have, I have one, Go I'll be it. very brief. Um, I mean, if we're talking about perform you know, performance, I mean, I would like to see all, in this particular slide, I'd like to see us in the, in the t where we are for every other um, indicator in the top four or five. Um, now, as far as low income goes, I, I actually think that our, um, if we're setting priorities, I think we, rather than, um, increasing before I think we need to for our, I think our priority needs to be unpacking yeah, it, we I'm need to understand and I don't I, I think rather than just focusing on I know this is end results but rather I think to get there I think the district needs we need to unpack um, we're not ready to set I, you're I, not ready to set a direction I, I just I don't I just how. don't think we under uh, uh, well maybe the, if maybe the staff does but I don't think the board yet understands um, understands the issue so I think yeah. we need to understand it too, yeah. or and begin to. And I'd like to right see that as a yeah. as a priority for the board, I guess. Now that and I'm just talking myself through this. Well, what I, specifically, I, are you speaking to? Sure. Thank you. Um, it's hard formulating thoughts at 10:30 at night. <laughs> I think the board need, we as we as a board large? need to understand begin to have, begin to understand what about making what about low income in this district. Uh, is driving it because I don't. I mean, low income in and of itself is not a um, character trait. I suppose um, it's a it's a circumstance, um, and I think so. I think as a board, we need to understand what is it that is maybe not common, but what character what what is it? What characteristics do our low income students have that are, I guess, correlated with with performance? I can tell you about my childhood if you wish. Sure. <laughs> Tomorrow, if and, by I, I mean, and I know that and that data. I mean that not just and I don't. I mean that data is available. I mean there are studies on this nationwide, but I think we need to understand what is what our district is. Perhaps is, is different than other others, and I think we we have enough. We should have a large enough sample size that we can look at. We can start to understand in our district what what it is. Other fact. Yeah. I mean honestly, we we have about thirty four hundred low income students within our district, which is bigger than most districts in Washington State. Yeah. Um, so we do have that capacity. And, really and so it. Eric, just as an example of what I think you mean by unpacking, we've got details on uh, low income. How long has that student been in our district? That, that def they're definitely gonna be more migratory than our average, except for the engineers. Um, the, the, how consistently is a child free and reduced? That is, there might be kids who are bouncing in and out of that definition through their career. Um, it, it's it's something where there is more to be teased out of the data that we have without collecting additional data, just diving in at a deeper level to help us understand where, I, I mean, we would like you to dive in and solve this, but that seems vague. We'd like to understand the problem, we'd like to understand the problem more so we can help explain the problem to constituents. How would you act upon it knowing that information? What would that change in the process. Well, and it, it's, it's really, to me, it's identifying the kids at greatest risk. That we've got, I mean, I don't want anyone to have the impression listening to this that low-income kids are failing. 
There are low-income kids who are succeeding. There's a difference here. What's, what's going on to, what, what additional risk factors are there associated with low-income kids who are not able to succeed in the system? And how can we help them? Or for that matter, just turning it on its head, what are we doing right to help the kids who are succeeding? And how can we propagate that sort of experience to the extent that we can take any credit for it at all? How can we propagate that to the kids who are not succeeding in the current system? If I can just add one thing, I think uh, what one wonder I have when we present the data is for all the exception groups, within that group, there are the students who are meeting standard and then there are the students who aren't meeting standard. And we tend to focus on the students who aren't meeting standard and what are we doing mm -hmm. to help those students. There's also a percentage of students within that group who are meeting standard, mm -hmm. to your point. And what we um, don't do as much is ask the question, what is it about those students who mm -hmm. are meeting standard, who are experiencing success, and what's the difference, yeah. kind of to Eric's right. point, between the students who are achieving within that group and the students who aren't, and is that yeah. something we can hone in on and... Just learn more uh, about where well, you've got... Well, I made earlier yeah. about ELL students. Yep. To talk to them afterwards, what worked for you? What didn't work for you? Yeah, no, there's, what there's a feedback home that really that made useful. the light come on over your head? I mean... So this might be interesting from a linkage concept, actually, yeah. and from some of the focus groups. I just know that the, the focus groups that were done by Puget Sound Equity um, or Puget Sound ESD on the equity, if you haven't had the chance to read through mm -hmm. those on that report, it's fabulous and very insightful, too. I think some of the, the qualitative pieces you're speaking to of what are those challenges within our schools and what we could do differently. Um, and I know that information is being utilized at the district on the equity team and different things, but from a board perspective, it's actually very interesting to read through as well um, and have some idea of that component. That's a good idea. Um, so I do think that might be the piece, how do we do the linkage? So if those are the questions from a qualitative side, how do we start to ask those questions of our students um, and families? In seven and a half hours, I have to take two children to jazz band. We have used up my last 10 minutes of consciousness. Um, I had let uh, Chris know earlier <laughs> that we can move the program report and the superintendent's report to the November 20 uh, board meeting, given the time. And that was about an hour ago that I, I let you it know was. that. Thank you. Um, so. I, 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 I mean, I, I am enjoying the conversation, but I'm not. Um, no, absolutely, but that's something to think about in the future as we look at oh, the no, process. No, I, <laughs> the you scare the what do you think I, this is good for? Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to echo what Siri said. Um, these are really important discussions to have. I, I, I know that we, had, we wanted to do it tonight, but in the future it would be great if we could start these before it would be night. Well, the question yeah. might be that we actually look at doing it as a work session at one point and have the discussion there to start and then be able to do, so that might be another way mm -hmm. that you have a little mm -hmm. more sure. time that's dedicated specifically. Yeah. So, Not necessarily next week, but something to think about. But all of that said, I don't know, we've got a whole lot more to say about the math ER. I'll send you my notes. Okay. That's effective. Because there's one more indicator I would think we would recommend, is, and that's remedial. Yes. How many okay. students, um, when they apply to college, end up having to do a take a math course yeah. um, that's remedial that doesn't give college credit, just as a way of sort of looking at a final step through the whole process. That's fair. I will include that in the conversation. But other than that, um, anybody really dying to add another thing that they can't send to me by email? Okay. Can I just say yes. one thing, Chris? So, uh, just, uh, so the assertion report then that mm -hmm. the board now completes, uh, that will be, uh, we would put that on the agenda for the November 20th meeting and the board would adopt the ER report. That's what we did for literacy, so I just want to make sure. What day is it? That's the plan. It's November 6th. Okay, so plan-wise, I will distribute the first draft of this to the rest of my colleagues 
on the 13th next week. And you can get comments back to me as rapidly or as slowly as you want, but we'll do a quick discussion <laughs> on the 20th. I think that's the plan. And similar to as we did the last time, if there were changes that needed to get made, exactly. we just postpone it for another two weeks to be on consent. So it's still open to discussion at that point. That is perfect. Okay. So um, with that, we'll close that. Uh, the program report and the soups report, we're gonna delay. Legislative update, no, we don't need one. Board follow-up, future agenda items, no. Debrief, board member comments, we've already made plenty. So the next board meeting will be on November 20th, 2017, at 5 p.m. with a reception to honor uh, Nancy Bernard. By the way, I forgot to acknowledge this explicitly. Nancy took off a little early because she has to be on the other end of the state at 8 a.m. to teach a class, so she's well excused in her absence for this part of the conversation. Um, We'll have a study session at 5.30, uh, topic being school start times and graduation policy. Um, that'll be next door in the Hughes room. And then at 7 o'clock, we'll have a board meeting here. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Second. Oh, second. <laughs> moved by Director La Liberty, seconded by Director Bleasner. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. We are adjourned.